Sports Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you. For the next couple of hours, I was hoping the vibes would be higher heading into the weekend, but that one was ugly. Uh, Very disappointing night for the Winnipeg Jets, really getting it handed to them by the desperate New Jersey Devils last night. 4-1 loss. We'll uh, dissect what happened and what didn't happen for the visitors last night. And then get ready for a very busy weekend. Back-to-back matinee games as the team finishes out this busy road trip out east. Tomorrow at noon, they drop the puck against the struggling New York Islanders with Patrick Roy behind the bench. And then the Washington Capitals, who the Jets handled uh, convincingly last Monday at home, will be the opponent. 11.30 a.m. start on Sunday Someone said maybe a little Benny and the Jets, Eggs Benny, and uh, a Jets game uh, <laughs> finishing up your, <laughs> finishing up your, uh, you know, getting a little fun, a uh, little different Sunday to uh, to get things going. Anyways, we're gonna get to all of it. Some very pointed and interesting comments from Brandon Dillon and Nikolai Ehlers after the game last night. They certainly weren't hiding the fact that they were not very good, certainly not good enough. Um, and Brandon Rowicki's gonna jump on. As will Scott Billick. We'll look at teams actually practicing as we go live right now on YouTube. So we'll keep our ear to the ground and uh, see what Mike's got cooking reporting for the Winnipeg Free Press from New York. And then it's not Friday without a visit from Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. We're going to get to the bottom of this Otani business with Lee, as well as the latest from the NFL offseason. And then it's Friday. You know what that means. Marbles time just before 3 o'clock, so make sure to join us then on YouTube. Just before we bring in Michael Remus, I have to thank the uh, wonderful team of sponsors that make Winnipeg Sports Talk happen every day, the great people of Princess Auto, our friends at Little Brown Jug, Cool Bet Canada, Consolidated Supply, Wallace & Wallace, Manitoba Battery, Canadian Club, Modern Man Barbershop, Royal Sports, Boston Pizza, the Winnipeg Jets, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, F Apparel, and hey, it's Friday. You know what that means. Go time for happy hour into the evening with a little brown jug. Uh, probably needed a couple of those to uh, wash away last night's game. Uh, let's get to it right now as we welcome everybody in chat. And, of course, everyone listening on the podcast. Let's bring Michael Remus here to get things going. Uh, Reem, I was really hoping we'd have a rambunctious group of Jet fans in the chat talking about four straight wins heading into the weekend. But... Uh, that was not the A game of the visitors last night. And disappointing, especially coming out of one of the best games of the year, going toe-to-toe and beating the Rangers in MSG. Yeah, the Devils not a playoff team. They're fighting really hard for it. And you thought, okay, can the Jets follow up that great performance on Tuesday with an equally great one on Thursday? And it just wasn't there. Uh, the penalty kill, Huss, uh, you know, the players, Brandon Dillon, not happy at all. We'll get to those clips, but... You know, I wonder if we should. We haven't really talked about it lately. It's been pretty good, um, but you look on the whole of the season, the penalty kill near the bottom third of the league, and uh, man, did New Jersey have a lot of speed. The Hughes, Bros, uh, Timo Meyer, Nico Heischer, they definitely have some talent on that team. And you mentioned, uh, I think, in your conversation with Steve Kalias, how much you know they're missing. Dougie Hamilton's kind of not really talked about that yeah. much when you look at the season, but. Uh, they look like a good team. They came to play. They were certainly ready for the Jets uh, Jets yesterday. So uh, certainly, it was definitely a tough one. We thought we'd have a win. You know, we were all fired up here on Wednesday. Had a big show. Uh, a bit more somber here heading into the back-to-back. But the Jets are usually pretty good on these back-to-back weekend games. I can't remember how many times I've started Monday saying, Jets sweep the weekend. So maybe <laughs> maybe we'll figure it out. I'll figure it out here. Yeah, well, I mean, they were 6-0 and going into the second end of back-to-backs before that ugly game a couple weeks ago in Vancouver after the shutout win in Seattle. Um, the one thing I'll give the team credit for so far this year is after stinkers like we saw last night, they've been pretty consistent with coming back and uh, getting their act together very quickly and not letting those linger. And uh, 
you know, listen, there has been a few ugly games over the past month or so, but, you know, in between, boom, you rattle off three in a row like they did after the Nashville game last week. So the team right now is still in first place, Remo, although those games in hand have sort of disappeared. And uh, as we look at the standings today, the Jets do occupy first place technically, but they have the exact same record as the Colorado Avalanche, but do get the nod as the number one team based on greater regulation wins and regulation and overtime wins. Dallas also tied at 93 points, but having played one more game, uh, they're playing game number 71 tonight uh, before the Jets get into a 70. I guess the Avalanche are in action tonight as well as a big favorites against the Columbus Blue Jackets. Yeah, Avalanche against Columbus, Dallas against Pittsburgh tonight. So they're still up there. And, uh, you know, Mark Sports Video and Chetty says, sometimes you just got to give credit to the opposition for their game plan. Forget about it and move on to the next game. I don't think this changes anything about the Jets. You know, they've played pretty well. They had uh, a game, you know, where they weren't at their best. We'll see how they respond. And I agree. They've certainly responded after losses. I know uh, Hellbuck will be in net and, uh, Brossois probably Sunday. They're practicing right now. I'm sure we'll get an update on the goal rotation as we go. But yeah, it was the you know New Jersey was moving fast. Jets took a bunch of penalties. I mean, you look at the penalties. What is it? Holding, hooking, tripping. Although there was one uh, too many men as well. So I mean, look, uh, they got some good players. The Hughes brothers. They're they're quick, and you saw it. You saw it yesterday. That's for sure. Jack Hughes, absolute legit stud. And, and you know what, Luke Hughes, I mean, they have, they're missing so many defensemen. They've traded a few guys. You mentioned Hamilton being out. I mean, Luke Hughes is playing on that top pairing. And, you know, I heard Kelly Moore and some of the guys in the pregame show saying, you know, this could be uh, eaten time for uh, the Lowry line. Um, it was eaten time for the Jersey power play and uh, the Devils overall. Like, I mean, I don't know about you. I, like, I thought the first period was... I mean, listen, it was low event, to be honest with you. I think the shots were 6-5. The Jets had a couple power plays where they did a good job of controlling the puck and ripping it around, but really didn't generate much when it comes to grade-A scoring chances. And Jake Allen was good as well. Um, But, man, coming into that second period, the Devils took advantage of their opportunities on the man advantage and really took it to the Winnipeg Jets. I mean, Ehlers, we'll get to the Ehlers goal, which was absolutely brilliant. I mean, that was one nice thing that happened uh, outside of a relatively ugly night for everybody not named Lorraine Brassois. Um, But despite giving up, what, 22, 23 shots on Brassois in the second period, they were still right there. And even after Devil scored in the third period to go up, I kind of felt like this would just be vintage Jets to uh, figure it out late, score a couple goals, and win. Uh, but you know what? Credit where credit is due. The Devils were the better team. They deserved to win, and they really took it to the Jets in the third period as well. I mean, a massive discrepancy in shot totals in the second and third period. And you know, if you're going to get a shot like that, you simply probably don't deserve to win, and uh, they'll need to be better tomorrow against the Islanders, to say the least. Yeah, 41-19 were the shots for the Devils, and yeah, 6-5 shots in the first very low event. Uh, the Jets had a nice two-on-one there with Toffoli to Ehlers and shot into the pad, and Ehlers got that chance later. They did have the power play, you said, not... Not much. There's not a lot of chances. I think uh, the first chance the Devils had was a breakaway as well, uh, off giveaway from Kyle Connor in the offensive zone. Uh, Nico Heischer ended up getting sprung, and Brossois saw it all night. And a lot of people in the chat talking about uh, that shutout streak that got broken in the second, almost 180 minutes. It was seven minutes and 25 seconds short of the franchise record. They showed that on the broadcast during the first intermission, and there was one goalie on there. I don't think anyone had ever ever heard of, but uh, Andre Pavlik had the record, and a lot of people saying, well, did TSN jinx the Jets by uh, showing that graphic? And I don't know, maybe they did. I see people in chat saying it's actually Frosty's fault from the Discord last night. Yeah. Well, but, yeah, so we have the WST Discord, and a couple times now Frosty's written, he's in the, always in the chat, he wrote shutout. And, uh, yeah, and then the other team scores right after. So, uh, obviously... Obviously, whatever they talk about in the broadcast, no bearing on the game, but it was kind of funny that they showed that graphic, and you're like, oh, wow, and then they score, uh, get the first goal of the game short, shortly after that. 
on the power play where it was a point shot. Uh, I think he sure tipped it or he got a rebound and then it was right to Hughes on the side of the net. Not much Brossois could do on that one. You know, speaking of that, just with the, the jinx and whatnot, you all know that I love to talk about the wave jinx and all that. If you talk to goalies, they'll be the ones, not all, but many, tell you, don't even mention it. Don't go there. Um, so I had to laugh. We'll give a shout out to Winnipeg Sports and Winnipeg Jet legend Joe Daly. Uh, and you can see uh, Joe's shop uh, on St. Mary's is at Joe Daly Sports on Twitter. Uh, did put out last night, just saying, they mentioned the consecutive shutout minutes between periods and mm, you know what happened next. Hashtag go Jets go. So, um, I mean, the one thing I'll say about, about you know, we can talk about the shutout streak and everything that Prasad was doing. He was the guy that deserved a better fate last night, Remus. I mean, this that game could have been far uglier on the scoreboard if he wasn't at the brilliant level that he's been consistently for the last few months last night. And I mean, that was the fact of the matter is the Jets were still very much in that game despite getting just snowed under in the second and third periods because LB was that damn good last night. Yeah, well, LB did have a shutout at even strength yesterday. 28 saves on 28 oh. shots. It was all on the power play that they did their damage. And, I mean, it's tough. Uh, it was the first one, you know, point shot. You know, ping pongs around, goes right on Hughes' stick. There was one uh, after a long shift, Nico Heischer uh, beat his man and went to the front of the net and tipped one past uh, Brossois. And I think that, oh, and then there was the last one where, you know, shot from Jack Hughes. This was the third goal. And, I mean, you look at the camera angle, I don't even think Brossois could see it at all. So the Devils power play working very well, moving around up top. Uh, the Jets really didn't have an answer for it yesterday. And, the Jets had, you know, they had power plays too. They went, to, but, you know, they didn't score on them. They went over, I think it was over four. Yes, over four for a power play that had been very good lately. And there's one power play too where, you know, they kept giving breakaways to the Devils. It was Thomas Nosek. I don't think it was a huge huh. scoring chance, but that spinorama backhand was pretty impressive. He even pulled it off. I think Nemec um, had another one on a power play as well. I mean, on a shorthanded for New Jersey. So I don't know the Jets not doing a great job protecting the puck, maybe being a bit too aggressive there, trying to get back in the game. You know, I agree. I, you know, he was 2-1. Uh, they had played well at even strength. He thought that they would get, you know, get something, but not a ton of scoring chances. It was the Ealers' goal, and uh, I thought Toffoli, the Ealers, Shakefully had a nice rush. I think it was late in the period or something, or one of the periods, but wasn't a lot of scoring chances. Ealers definitely the most dangerous jet last night when it came to, uh, you know, offensive scoring chances, and the one highlight for the Jets outside of all the brilliant saves by Brassois was Ehlers' goal. And, I mean, this was – it reminded me of that game. What was it, a couple weeks ago in Chicago? He hadn't scored in a little while, and he had two and was basically vintage Ehlers, getting the puck, skating around everybody, going in and ripping one in past Jake Allen. And, um, you know, you, listen, those are – you have – even in a game like that, you have to just sit back and appreciate the brilliance of a goal like that. Unfortunately, there wasn't much more other than that from the Jets as a whole offensively. And, um, you know, you mentioned the fact that they spent too much time in the penalty box and the PK had a real tough time killing the uh, killing the penalties. Um, Colin Miller, uh, obviously, back in the lineup last night to play against his old team. You know, it, it's it's tough for Miller. I mean, you've you've got a group of defensemen that are battling, you know, to be in the lineup. Miller played in the Nashville game, which was the last time he had a real underwhelming performance by the club. Sits out three games, all big, convincing wins for the Winnipeg Jets, and then comes back in and they lose again. So, I, uh, you know, and this is something we'll get into with Rewicki and with Billick. Um, and I heard Ken talking about this last night. I really think the Jets' top six blue liners are the top six that have basically been there throughout the year. And you can decide who of Logan Stanley or Colin Miller is next in. But I think we're, we basically are going to see that same top six dream as throughout the year that's been being uh, the number one, well, the game one lineup, presuming everyone's healthy come playoff time. Yeah, just on the Nikolai Ehlers goal, you know, you, after that one against Chicago, Mike Kelly, we, we've had on the program a number of times from NHL Network, says, Third, that was his third coast-to-coast -coast goal. Nobody has more 
in the league than Nikolai Ehlers that was as of last month. I don't know if that goal yesterday counts as coast to coast, but certainly went from his own blue line. Pretty damn close. Yeah, he went from his own blue line and you know, made Brendan Smith uh, look really silly, uh, deke around him and beating Jake Allen with a quick shot. I think he tried to do that shot too on the chance from Toffoli, but tried to go five hole wasn't there. And I kind of agree. I mean, you look at the team in terms of goals against us, they're best in the league. And who's been on the D third pair the whole season? Nate Schmidt. So I don't know if he really gave them a reason for them to take him out. And you know, he played pretty well in that big win. And I don't want to blame you know Colin Miller directly, but it's funny you mentioned he was in uh, for the two losses. But I don't think like Nate Schmidt did anything that uh, you know that where he deserved to be taken out. And uh, is Colin Miller like that big of an upgrade over him? And do you want to just stick with the guys? That got you there, and you know maybe they'll continue with the uh, you know the D rotation. We'll we'll have to see. I'm just looking at the pairs for today. Uh, Stanley and Miller is the fourth pair of today's skate, according to Mike. So uh, we'll have to see what happens this weekend. But I'm not opposed to the D rotation. But I think Schmidt should be. I agree. He's ahead of those two other. Guys. I mean, listen. Some guys are going to get some games over the course of these last dozen games. That's fine. Um, if you want to play them because you think you might need them come playoff time. But I think it's pretty clear what the uh, what the story is for the Jets as it comes to uh, their top six defense. I did joke with the guys, and we're going to wait to see what the uh, Mike McIntyre is at practice right now. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, those are the defense pairings. No Nikolai Ehlers on the ice today. Um, he's getting a day off. Uh, we'll find out whether there's anything more to that. Uh, but Connor Shifley, I have fallow. Perfetti skating with Monaghan and Toffoli, presumably in Ehlers' spot. Lowry, Nino, Appleton, Gus, Baron, Nemetsnikov, and Kapari, the extra forward. I am interested to hear the latest on Rick Bonus and whether he will be meeting the club in New York this weekend. I joked yesterday, Reem, with the guys that I was watching the game with that considering the way things went, Bones might be on his way to the airport for a red eye 5 a.m. flight so he could get there in time for practice <laughs> after what happened last night. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to see. I was encouraging to hear earlier this week that they thought maybe he'd be back for the weekend. I mean, Scott Arneal has done a good job, and they have rebounded after uh, poor games like that. I mean, we saw against, what was it, uh, was it the Tuesday game? After a rough one on the weekend, I'm you know the schedule is all blurring all together, but they usually Rangers, are pretty good. Rangers was on. Uh, Rangers, the Rangers was on Tuesday. What was the one before that? Was that the no? They beat up on Anaheim and Columbus. I'm thinking of the weekend before with the Vancouver one, maybe. Yes. I, I don't. I don't remember. This schedule has it's. <laughs> it's so long, 82 games. We've only got like less than 15. Less than focused 15 on left. the weekend. Focused on the weekend and moving forward. I, I'm um, just looking ahead. We'll, uh, yeah. Well, uh, but listen, before we move ahead, let's uh, hear a little bit of the uh, aftermath of last night's game. Um, here's Scott Arneal, acting head coach, while Bones gets uh, fixed up. Here's uh, what Arnie had to say about uh, the loss to the New, New Jersey Devils. You know, it, our, our PK had been trending better than what it showed tonight. and Can't give up three goals. Uh, you know, we had some chances to clear pucks. We didn't. We had some, you know, situations there even right, right near the end where it was almost over and we just kind of fell asleep on those situations. But, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it was their, their power play was uh, certainly a lot more dangerous than ours was. We knew that New Jersey would probably be a desperate team given yeah. the standings. Did you feel like maybe their desperation kind of overmatched whatever you guys were able to kind of bring? Yeah. Well, they were, I mean, you know, the first period there, they weren't giving us much in the way of rush. They were sitting back with their five guys in a neutral zone. They were kind of waiting for us to make mistakes. Uh, we were kind of just hanging in there. We were playing, and I didn't think our execution was great in the first, but, you know, I think just at the end of the day, we were, um, you know, it was one of those games that, you know, we just had to stay patient. It was 1-1 going into the third period, and at the end of the day, we gave up the two power play goals, and it's a big difference. Yeah, and, um, you know, Arnie mentioning, I mean, the special teams, a massive difference. I, I know some people said, well, they lost that game on special teams. Technically, yes, um, but it, it wasn't like... They were dominating at five on five, and that sort of happened. I mean, it just was not a great night. They also got owned in the faceoff circle. And Monaghan, who's been so good, he had an off night. I think he was five and fifteen in the dot. The Devils winning almost sixty-four percent of the faceoffs last night. Jets thirty-six percent. So uh, 
listen, there wasn't a lot to love except for Ehlers' goal and in particular the performance of LB. Lauren Brassois, here's what Arnie had to say about uh, LB's performance as well as a quick look ahead to uh, these back-to-back matinees against the Islanders and Caps. We can't give them, you know, we can't make them work that hard. Any goaltender, you know, I mean, we got to, we gave up some quality and, you know, I know that after they get up a little bit, we were still trying to press for, for offense. But at the end of the day, we're known for our defending, you know, our end of the rink and get, not giving up much, not giving teams a lot of opportunities, five on five. And tonight we did that. Uh, we didn't do that as well. Just last one for me, but is this a good precursor of what you're probably going to see this weekend? Some right. more teams kind of in a yeah. very similar Yeah, and point. we talked about it, you know. I mean, I knew it was a big game against the Rangers, and, you know, it was a letdown tonight, but we got some hungry animals that we're going to be facing here, and uh, if you don't if you don't bring your best, uh, you know, those are tip results happen. All right, so there's uh, what uh, Scott O'Neill had to say after the game. Pretty animated and, and pissed off, Brendan Dillon also spoke to the media afterwards. And uh, I'll give him credit. I mean, they, he certainly didn't sugarcoat it. Here's what he had to say about uh, last night's game in Jersey. Just, yeah, un- unacceptable, really. I mean, we lost the game on special teams. We know how how important it is on both sides of it. Um, giving your team momentum, a big goal, a big kill at the right time and I mean you know our power play like they had a couple looks you know their goalie play it made some good saves but like to give up fucking three PK goals is just uh, absolutely not just not acceptable for us and we've like you said we've been we're getting better but like we just can't like especially at this time of the year the points are too important um we know how desperate these teams are we have a big win the other night against you know one of the top teams in the east and you know especially going in the long island now it's not going to get any easier so we just gotta find a way whatever get in the lane pick up sticks um yeah can't happen that is one pissed off individual (laughs) was there an f-bomb that just kind of squeaked in there as well reem well, when you give up three uh, power play goals, yeah, I mean, of course, you're going to be livid. I can almost see the steam coming out of him, um, just livid. Uh, Brandon I appreciate Dillon. that. I'd way rather have that, a guy that comes in and kind of owns it, and you can see how angry they are as opposed to just not making much of it. Um, yeah, Brendan Dillon was not a happy camper afterwards. And uh, here's a little bit more from Dylan Mike, of course, who's there with the Winnipeg Free Press, asked him about some of the uh, unfortunate bounces on that first goal. Tough sequence on that first one, right? Because you block a shot and you're kind of hobbling off and I guess the change comes a little early to try and help you out. And, yeah. and uh, on the ensuing power play, I think it was Sandberg takes the shot off the yeah. floor or something. I mean, yeah, like the, the bounce is... <laughs> I eat one there right off the knee. Yeah, it's just getting frustrating. We got other guys on the ice that, you know, whether that, like I said, it's a clear or, or you know, getting in another lane. Um, unfortunate, we've, we've just got to just got to find a way, like find a way to kill these. You know, I, I mean, and again, this won't be a, as good for people listening on the podcast than watching. But I mean, his facial expressions, I cannot remember a guy outwardly looking as pissed off as Brendan Dillon did in those clips that we just played after the game last night. I agree. Uh, look at him. He's just like so angry. Like, <laughs> I, sometimes I feel bad. Like, having, you know, I love the emotion, but imagine just like having a terrible day at work. You just were on the ice for, or gave up three power play goals and you have to answer like, hey, man, you guys really suck tonight. What do you think about that? But that's. I mean, you love that these guys care. You want, you know, you think we think they're going to bounce back tomorrow and this weekend, but uh, he's not happy. And I mean, they talk about it and address it for sure, but uh, it's got to stink. It being again three of four in the power play for New Jersey. It reminded me of uh, of your reaction post shows uh, back in the day when the the mute button was. Uh was being oh. utilized too much. And you, you would God. sometimes pull a, pull a Brendan Dillon with uh, that sort of post-game reaction. Um, listen, as angry as Dillon obviously was, um, you know, he did say, we've got two games coming up this weekend. And uh, listen, they put themselves in a great position. They're still in first place. You can't make too much of it. And you do need to stay positive. 
We've got to stay positive. We've, of course, big picture for the last you know, almost 70 games, we've played very well. We've put ourselves where we're still, uh, you know, top in our division, but we're we're in a heavy race here to the end. And um, you know, special teams, especially come playoff time, if teams are going to play physical and hard, and you know, take an extra run at somebody, we've got to you know be able to make them pay on the power play. And same thing on the PK. We've uh, you know we've got to make crucial crucial kills at certain right times for us. So. Every single one of these games is a tune-up for that. We, we want to stay positive. We're, we're a confident group for sure. But, um, yeah, just, just not, a, not a great night for us. Uh, all right, Brandon Dillon. And, uh, Remo, why don't you set up this next one too? Because this Dillon had, I guess, just been asking or answering a question from sure. a New Jersey media member uh, about Jack Hughes yeah. and then uh, kind of went back to the Jets. Yeah, so he's, uh, I guess, as a visiting or home media from New Jersey. He says, hey, what do you think of Jack Hughes? And he's like, oh, yeah, Jack Hughes is a really good player. His next question is about Nick Ehlers and uh, about the Ehlers goal. And it's almost like Dylan like forgot that his name is. So if anyone doubted out there that his nickname was Fly, I think that's the only thing that they call him. Uh, what? Hold on. Someone, so, Hello? It, it is someone true. Someone just tried to come in my door. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'll play the Sorry. clip and then see what's going on. <laughs> Here's Dylan on Ehlers. Nick, oh, uh, Fly, I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, really, uh, what can you say more about him? Um, you know, we, we see him do those uh, all the time uh, for us this, uh, during the year. He's uh, elite, elite level skill with elite level speed. So um, it's, it's amazing what those guys can do. Uh, all they need is uh, one opportunity like that to, to make a pay. It was a big, big goal at a big, uh, crucial time in the game for us and unfortunately couldn't keep it going. Do you think that would change momentum for you after after uh, his goal? Uh, after Ehlers' goal, uh, I mean, we were hoping. Um, you know, it wasn't the start we wanted, but um, you know, frustrating to, to you know not to not get a lead after that. All right. Well, a frustrated Brendan Dillon did crack a smile when uh, talking about Ehlers' goal because that was uh, phenomenal. Um, but Ehlers, uh, like his teammate, uh, also not pleased with uh, the the way their team played last night, and obviously the result. Here's what uh, Nick had to say, Fly had to say about last night's game. Uh, just overall, not good enough. Um, obviously, special teams wasn't there, uh, both of them, and um, you know the five on five. I think we. At times, did a lot of really good things and got chances, and um, and then there was also a lot of times where we didn't do the right thing, and, and you know they were able to skate around in our zone and get big chances. So um, we're not happy with this one. Surprised a bit because it seemed like both special teams have been trending in the right direction lately. Power play has been better. PK has been good. Just a tough night at the office for both. Um. I don't know. I mean, sometimes it goes that way, and and you know, you 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 can't score a power play goal every night. You know, we obviously try to, and our PK is trying to to shut their PP down every single night. But um, obviously, we need to do a lot uh, do a lot better. All right, there's uh, Nick Ehlers. And, um, you know, I mean, for uh, all the power play time the Jets had, and it was tough for him to really speak too much on special teams because, you know, right now he's still on that second power play unit. The Jets had a lot of puck control, didn't do a lot of great things with it, I thought. Um, and, you know, you look at guys like, uh, you know, Kyle Connor pushing six minutes on, on the power play and Nick Ehlers less than two minutes and, you know, not on for any of the PK, uh, PK last night. As we mentioned, the one thing that did stand out Outside of Loren Brassois was uh, Ehlers' brilliant goal. Uh, here's what he had to say about uh, getting the team on the board. Well, I kind of came in uh, on the ice and, you know, saw they got a little tired and just wanted to turn it right away and get it into their zone. Um, but I think I kind of saw a lane open up for me to take it through and, and yeah. All right. Um, as we mentioned, the... Uh, <laughs> The one, the brightest spot from a Jets perspective is Loren Brossois. All of his teammates, I think, uh, realized just, you know, he he played a game worthy of getting a win. It certainly didn't happen. Uh, Ehlers commented on uh, another great start for Loren last night. Um, well, I mean, you guys have seen it all year. Our goalies have been unbelievable. Um, 
and you know even tonight it was three three power play goals um, that we let in so um, you know he's been outstanding bucky has been outstanding and and you know the job they're they're doing for us and and you know we're obviously trying to keep keep the puck out um, and, and not give up big chances um, but when we do they uh, they're pretty pretty good back there all right, so, uh, you know, some praise for LB, and uh, they're used to it right now. Imagine Hellebuck will be the guy tomorrow, and then Brassois will get a chance to go up against the Capitals at that 11.30 a.m. Winnipeg time start coming up on Sunday. One more from Ehlers, and you can't really dwell on this one. Uh, a look ahead to uh, the matchup with the Islanders tomorrow from 27. You look at our schedule from now until, until the end of the season. Uh it, it's going to be a lot of fun in the sense of we're going to be playing a lot of a lot of really good teams that you know are either fighting uh, for a spot or we're right next to them in the standings or whatever it is. So um, it's going to be a lot of really fun games and and we need to be better. Um, this wasn't our game tonight. We uh, we know what we need to change and we got to do that next game. All right, all systems go for uh, the Islanders tomorrow afternoon. Islanders losing. What felt like a loser leaves town match last night against the Detroit Red Wings, giving up, I think, three in the third period, losing six to three. And the Islanders have now lost six games in a row. Two points back of Washington, six points back of Philadelphia. And as far as the uh, wild card goes, they are five points back of the Detroit Red Wings with one game in hand. Washington, who the Jets are going to see on Sunday, Three points back of Detroit with two games in hand. Very much still in it, despite that loss to the Leafs last time out. Um, we're going to look ahead to the weekend and much more with Brandon Rewicki coming up in just a second on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Well, spring is just about here, gang, and our friends at Consolidated Supply are ready for a very busy spring and summer and the change of the seasons. You know the gang at Consolidated Supply are the leaders in irrigation systems, artificial turf, and of course, Golf Carts in Manitoba is the official club car dealer with incredible new and used options for you in regards to golf carts. They've also got other amazing options for your property, including hot tubs and incredible outdoor kitchens. And of course, they're also the leaders in small engine parts and repair. Consolidated Supply has so much waiting for you. Come on down and see them at their beautiful showroom, open to the public at 1395 Niagara Road East, or find out everything Consolidated Supply can do for you online at cte.ca. Our friends at Manitoba Battery are enjoying the beauty of their new location over on Dovercourt Road. It is officially open, and Donnie and his staff welcome you down at the original location at 1026 Logan, but at the new spot at 452 Dovercourt Drive. And as part of the grand opening celebrations, any battery that's normally $60 or more will save you an extra $10 if you pick it up in store. But, of course, you know Manitoba Battery is your local option with the best prices on batteries of all makes, models, shapes, sizes, whatever you need, beating the pants off the big box stores. And, of course, they will deliver to you for free any battery purchase inside the perimeter of Winnipeg. Over 60 bucks is just that easy. So head on over to ManitobaBattery.com or pop by and visit the fellas at the new location 452 Dovercourt Drive, and of course, the original spot at 1026 Logan Avenue. Guys, if you need to get a fresh new look as we head into spring, you know where to do that. Get on over to one of the eight Modern Man Barber Shops, conveniently located throughout the city of Winnipeg, including their two newest standalone locations on Pemina Highway or on Plessy Road. Modern Man Barbershops offer a variety of grooming services, including haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. The easiest way to make an appointment and book your look is at modernmanbarber.com. Make sure to give them a follow on Instagram as well, at Modern Man Barbershops. And we would also have a huge thank you to the great people at Canadian Club for their continued support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. And, of course... The Winnipeg Blue Bombers is the official spirit of the blue and gold. We'll be counting down the days till we're enjoying 
CC's at the Rum Hut and the Jim Beam Social House and CC's and Ginger's at the stands at Princess Auto Stadium. But while we wait for football to return, you can always get the great taste of Canadian Club and all their amazing products at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. Pop by today and check out the Canadian Club display. And remember, always enjoy responsibly. All right, let's get back to the pucks and more with uh, the eloquent host of Skates and Plates available wherever you get your favorite podcasts, our pal Brandon or Wiki. Rue, what's up, man? How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm a lot better now. Eloquent. I don't know if I've ever, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever been tossed that one, but just greasing you up before you come on and chop it up a little bit. But uh, hey, no, I mean, listen, the, the the pot is great, and it's probably more fun doing episodes after games like Tuesdays than the one we saw last night. Uh, not the A game of the Winnipeg Jets, to say the least. Yeah, they sucked. Um, to put it eloquently, uh, it was, I mean, it's funny too because it, it's always interesting because episodes are almost like temperature checks on on the fan base, and it was just a, a complete one eighty from the Rangers game, like you said, where you know I, I didn't love the way they played in the last like eight minutes of the Rangers game, but other than that, you know, going toe to toe with one of the best teams in the league in their barn. And it showing up very nicely. Like you're feeling pretty damn good about yourself. And then it was a stink bomb out there in, in, in New Jersey. And it was, you know, it kind of reminded me a little bit, Huss, of you know, not, not so much this year and last year, but a few years back when the Jets would play Montreal. And, and the Habs were never a great team, but they would just struggle with the with the speed and you know, kind of like a smaller team. And they would just get skated all over by by Montreal. That's it was kind of like a flashback to those games because the devils for all their faults a ton of skill and a ton of speed and if you don't want to come skating they're going to make you look foolish and and that's what happened combined with a, a rearing of the ugly head of the special teams woes that we saw in the first half of the year yeah and you know what i kind of felt for the for the pk guys too because i mean they gave a couple power play goals up like two seconds left in the power play, six or eight. You sort of hold on for that long. And I mean, we saw a really frustrated Dylan DeMello after one of the late ones went in. And I don't know if you caught the clips of Brendan Dillon, but oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I listen, he adds so much to the team in a lot of different ways. He was a perfect guy to have in front of the media last night because he did not bite his tongue at all. And as I was mentioning to people listening on the podcast, check out the YouTube because – like just his facial expressions, talking about the game, talking about the performance they got from Lauren Brassois. Um, you could see that he uh, legitimately angered by everything that happened last night. But as he mentioned later on, I mean, 82 games, you will have a few of these. The bottom line is you got to get right back to it uh, tomorrow against the Islanders. <laughs> There's the picture of Dylan. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, and you know what? Overall, they've done a pretty good job of coming back after stinkers with uh, much better performances. And certainly that'll be the goal for tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, the, the Jets are in a weird spot where, you know, the, their playoff position isn't in doubt. Um, you know, they're, they're going to find themselves in a, in a good spot after 82 games. I, I think there's no longer a question about, you know, what, what this team is like. Um, are they for real or not, at least here in Winnipeg? But there, there's there's a lot of importance in these games because they're in a three-way tie for first in the division right now to try to avoid one of the other two teams that's chasing them and tied with them right now in the opening round. So, like, there's a lot of importance to the games, but there also needs to be a bit of an understanding of, they, they don't overly matter in the grand scheme of things because, yeah, you, you do have a stinker once in a while. I mean, Dallas, didn't Dallas just blow a massive lead the other night in the third period? And then they find a way to come back from it. So it's not the game itself that, you know, you're worried about the team's long-term future because of it. It's more team below the playoff line. You're not going to have too many more of those games down the stretch. So you got to find a way to, to take advantage of those. Although the one concerning thing that definitely came out of that was the way that the penalty kill looked way too passive for me. And again, one of the big problems with this team, for whatever reason, five on four, they just don't do a whole lot in front of the net. Like all, I mean, they, they, they all felt like cheap goals too. That That's the thing that kind of, I think that's why Dylan was really pissed off is that it wasn't, you know, a Jack Hughes cross ice one time or bar and in, but it's ones where with how well Brassois was playing, you know, you do your job in front of the net. Maybe you find a way to sneak into OT and get a point you didn't totally deserve. Yeah, well, I mean, as they say, we can 
I, I was I was said, you know, usually these Friday shows are so fun and everyone's fired up for the weekend. It sort of the vibes weren't as great coming into today. But uh, you know, we heard from it, Dylan. We heard from Ehlers. I mean, you got to get right back at it. The team's practicing today, and um, an interesting game tomorrow. I mean, the Islanders have been so streaky under Patrick Waugh. They started very poorly. Then they got on a big-time heater. They won six in a row and actually put themselves into a spot where I think they had a better than 50% chance to be one of those wild-card teams. Uh, they've just completely lost it going into, to- going into tomorrow. And it'll be very interesting to see the emotional level of that team in an early game, Brandon, considering they were on the wrong end of what felt like a loser leaves town match last night in Detroit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was the, what did Shifley say last week? Something about the dinosaur. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah that, call, call the dinosaur. Yeah. Well, the Islanders called a few dinosaurs over the last six games <laughs> because all, all they had to do with the flyers and, and the red wings and seemingly every team in the Eastern playoff bubble falling apart. All they had to do was play 500 hockey. And then they probably booked their postseason ticket and, and instead it's six straight losses. So, I mean, your guess is as good as mine as to which Islander team we're, we're going to see uh, take, take the ice tomorrow afternoon. Again, it's it's kind of a dangerous one. It's like the Devils too, where like they've, they've got talent and, and Sorokin's one of the five best goalies on the planet. So it's, it's not like it's an easy matchup per se, but they just haven't been playing anywhere near decent hockey for, for, for quite some time. So, I mean, yeah, that, it's a fair point that, you know, dropping that one to the Red Wings in regulation probably feels like a death knell for them. But, I mean, I, I know every team saying this just outside the playoff line, but it's true for them, too. Like, they string together two, three wins in a row. They're going to find themselves right back in it. So, I, I don't think we'll see a totally despondent um, Islanders squad at home. They, they might look at this as, you know, this might be, Okay, the one against Detroit sucked, but this is the this is the final one. We we don't win this one, then we could pretty much call it curtains for the season. Well, and, and it's funny. I mean, obviously, being in the West and being in this cra- middle of this crazy run in the Central with Dallas and Winnipeg and uh, the Abs all tied at the top of the division. Um, the most interesting playoff race right now is certainly for that wild card, but interesting because it doesn't really seem like anybody wants to go and grab it. And I mean. Uh, I love your thought on the Washington Capitals. I mean, they looked defeated when they were here last week. I mean, that that Jet performance against Spencer Carberry's team was dominant from start to finish. They had the puck the entire game. Carberry said as much afterwards. Then they go and give up seven to the Oilers, and it looks like, okay, stick a fork in them. And then they go rattle off three in a row in Seattle, in Vancouver, in Calgary, um, and come back and are right there in the mix. I mean, this team, they are three points back of Detroit, but have two games in hand. They won't have Tom Wilson, who, of course, is uh, going to be sat down by NHL player safety for that absurd high stick against the Leafs a couple nights ago. But somehow, they are back in the middle of this, and it also coincides with Alex Ovechkin and starting to score, although he looked invisible in the game in Winnipeg last week. That hasn't been the case, though, really, since they were here in Winnipeg and Edmonton. Yeah, I mean, Washington would easily be the worst playoff team in history. Like, you'd, you'd, you'd have to, honestly, you would have to go back to the, what was it, the 67 expansion? When they had a, an actual expansion division and teams were basically pushed into the playoffs? That would be the last time we've seen it. I mean, they're they're not a good team. I, it's mind blowing, and I know Cavs fans say, "Well, you know, we win every game by one, and we lose every game by six. Well, that, that's not really a ringing endorsement of your team. Minus thirty-one that. goal differential. It's crazy. Like it, it, that puts them basically with the Columbuses, the Arizonas. It, it, it's, it's. I mean, there's no other way to put it, but they, they've just been lucky. Like they've been extremely lucky in one goal games this year, and I. I I can't really point to any other reason as to why they're in the spot that they are. They're in the bottom third of literally every single team metric. Like every team that's on it, there's one. It'd be one thing if you could say, oh, the the power play is fourth in the league. And and so that's the one thing that's keeping them in it. They're they're not really good at anything, (laughs) but they find themselves where they are right now. Um, I'd be shocked. I'll I'll still be shocked if they find a way to get close to it. But I I do like what somebody said on, on Twitter a few days ago that the Capitals are going to be the only team to make the playoffs against their will. Because that's what it looks like. They, they, they didn't have any interest in getting there at the trade deadline. And then 
due to the ineptitude of the other Eastern teams, they find themselves within striking distance. Like, check this out. This is gold differential. Teams, here's the list of teams in the NHL right now today with a worse goal differential than the Washington Capitals. The Montreal Canadiens, the Columbus Blue Jackets, the Anaheim Ducks, the Chicago Blackhawks, and the San Jose Sharks. That's it. Like, Ottawa is better. Coyotes, better. Kraken, Flames, Wild. Um, it's It really is wild. And, you know, you look at Jersey, at the team we saw last night, who has a worse record, but they're a minus 10 right now. They've got, I think we'd all agree, I mean, higher-end talent, certainly in the prime of their career, like a Jack Hughes right now. Um, they hadn't been able to get saves. Jake Allen actually has been just what the doctor ordered. You just wonder what Jersey would be like if they would had been able to make a deal like that a month earlier, like the way the Jets solved the problem with Sean Monaghan, as opposed to waiting till it was pretty much over for them at the deadline. Uh, it's crazy. I, I couldn't even imagine the rage I would feel if I was a Devils fan. Like I, I don't. I would be more mad that you actually made the trade. You're the doing deadline. this now? Then do nothing. Yeah, like dude, you were watching this team two months ago. Like we could have we, we could have pulled this one off a while back. Uh, yeah, I was surprised. I was just surprised they did something because it's like if you're gonna wait this long, I mean, just ride out the rest of the season, right, and then revisit it in the off season. But I mean, not, not a whole lot's going right for Washington. But Charlie Lindgren's been maybe the brightest spot for them this year. If he was over there in New Jersey, they they'd be about ten points clear of the Capitals and the rest of the bubble line for a playoff spot, right? So uh, yeah, it's an odd. The, the Metro is. Uh, Metro doesn't really make a whole lot of sense this year outside of the Rangers and Hurricanes. Those two teams are where we thought they were. The other seven are just, it, it's its bizarro world for each and every one of them for totally different reasons. No doubt. We'll get to that in, in just one minute. Um, just before we move on from the Jets, I mean, obviously we've got these you know back-to-back matinee games. Um, but just thoughts on next week. Uh, because coming to Canada Life Center will be the Edmonton Oilers and then the Vegas Golden Knights, Ottawa on Saturday, which uh, hopefully will be a, a fun game that the Jets can roll like they did on the Friday night last week against the Ducks. But not to overlook these two games on the weekend, you know what the, the task at hand is to keep, bounce back after an ugly one in Jersey. But, man, those two games at home are going to be fun Tuesday and Thursday against Edmonton, and then we'll see what Vegas has in their tank as they kind of push to try to confirm their participation first and foremost in the Stanley Cup playoffs. That's going to be a beauty. Um, there, there's, it's interesting because I kind of feel like Vegas is Winnipeg's kryptonite, but I also feel like the Jets are the Oilers' kryptonite as well. And so it's an interesting sort of, you know, <laughs> three-way tag match between these teams as to who ultimately can solve who here. Winnipeg has always played Edmonton surprisingly well, but they're... I don't know. I, I know a lot of people were upset about the Oilers maybe quote-unquote inactivity at the deadline or inability to make a massive splash because, you know, Adam Adam Henrique wasn't the the needle mover that, you know, whatever Vegas did. But I don't know, man. I think the Oilers might be the – they might be my team to beat in, in the West right now. Like they're – you can kind of feel things slowly clicking into gear for them. Um, so I, I'm I'm intrigued to see how the Jets match up with with the Oilers on 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 Thursday night there. But tell you what, you wouldn't want this to be the case. But it very well might turn out to be that Winnipeg Vegas on Tuesday is a first round preview. So yeah, <laughs> it'd be pretty good to solve them in that one before you might meet up with them in round one. You know what? And we've been talking about this all week on the why not question of the day for uh, for not um, <laughs> like there's you could play Dallas, you could play Colorado. You could win the division and play either Nashville, Vegas, or the Los Angeles Kings. Um, I mean, the Kings probably, I mean, I think if you were picking an opponent, the Kings probably are that team. Nashville is just simply out of their mind. They've been the hottest team in the league for over a month. Can they keep that going into the playoffs? I guess we'll see. Um, but the unknown of what the Vegas Golden Knights are going to be in the first round is, uh, is something that I think everyone wants to find out through somebody else first yeah. than uh, than themselves. Yeah, I, I people say you, you got to beat the champs to be the champs. No, you don't. Let somebody else do it. 
Like, let, let, let somebody else go after them for six, seven games, and then take on the winner of that one. Like, I, I've never understood that logic. Give me the easiest possible path to the Stanley Cup as possible, and we'll take our chances with that, as opposed to maybe not being battle-tested by the time round two goes around. So, I count me out as one of the people that wants to see Vegas in the opening round. I'll, I'll take my chances with a team that, you know, doesn't find a way to go to the conference finals almost every single season of their freaking existence. I mentioned the uh, the why not question of the day. I'll put this to you and everybody in chat. Not your preferred matchup, but what do you think the most likely first round matchup is for the Winnipeg Jets? I'm going to say Dallas. I'm with you. That, that, that's yeah. kind of like, I think, I mean, all of this has to do with who's going to win the central division. And you know, I mean, we kind of talked about these games coming up, those three games at home. Um, the Jets then go out on the road. Minnesota, Nashville, Dallas, Colorado. The Central really is going to be determined. At least the Jets' fate in the Central is going to be determined that week. But we are seeing an Avalanche team that is flexing right now on everyone they're playing. Um, they'll probably do the same in a massacre of the Columbus Blue Jackets tonight. Um but that is the team that I think is running. Can you imagine a Colorado Vegas first round series? And I think Vegas matches like Vegas might be the one team. Speaking of Kryptonites, like the the Golden Knights look pretty damn good against a full strength Avs team a few years back, right? Like that was with back when they had Nazem Kadri the year before they won the cup. So that, that would be pretty. That would be pretty insane. Like and again, there like give me the winner of that series in round two after those two teams beat the hell out of each other for, for six or seven games, as opposed to facing either one of them in round one. I think I don't think the Jets are too far behind, but I think, you know, I mentioned Edmonton. I mean, to me, Edmonton, Colorado are probably just a smidgen above everybody else in the West, for me, going into the playoffs. And then you have Winnipeg, Dallas, Vegas, Vancouver, as that tier that's just a tiny, tiny bit below them. Um, I kind of... I mean, I I think that I don't have any reason to doubt the Jets playing strong down the stretch, but I'm kind of with you where I think I think Colorado's just going to take this to another level here. And unless the Jets reel off, you know, eight wins in their next nine games, it, it might just be too tough to catch the Avalanche, who they look like they made all the right moves at the deadline and are uh, are starting to kick this one into high gear. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I look at it, I, I have to think. I mean, really, the only two teams you can sort of write off as uh, you will not be playing them unless you make it to the third round is Edmonton and Vancouver. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, Vegas and uh, the Kings could swap on either side, and depending on what first-place team has more points, um, Nashville could be in the mix as well. So, I mean, five possibilities, two not possibilities, and it's certainly going to make it uh, going to make it real fun. Hey, listen, I have to ask you, um, being a flyer guy about <laughs> torts this week. Uh, what did you think? I mean, uh, Kachuri has not been good for a pretty extended period of time. But, man, that was vintage torts. And and he's, all his players always say how good of a communicator he is. Something seems to be missing right now between he and his captain. A captain that was just named, what, a month ago? What do you make? Like, what's going oh, yeah. on there? Named by Torts, by the way. Yes. <laughs> like, so here's the C. And by the way, hope you enjoy the press box for two of the biggest games of our season. I, I, it's it's a mixed bag for me, Huss. Like, if you're going to preach accountability, you can only do that by holding everybody to the same standard. Like, I, I do understand that. And so some people saying you can't scratch the captain or you can't do this with certain players on your team. Well, if, if, if you if you believe in that, then you can't really truly be accountable ever because there are different standards to different players in that scenario. So I don't necessarily disagree with Torts on on that. If he feels like, you know, Kateri just isn't doing whatever he wants him to do, then, you know, if you're going to hold people to certain standards, you have to hold the captain, your most impactful player potentially, to the highest of standards as well. What, what, what I don't like is the seeming misunderstanding miscommunication like if you're going to make a move of that magnitude and stature i feel like you at the very least owe it to your captain to meet with them personally before you make that decision public which he did not do 
And then I also think it's important as the coach to to talk to the media. Like if you're going to be accountable, you try to hold your players accountable. Well, you've got to be accountable after you make a big decision like that as well. So I, I didn't love the way he handled it. But again, if you're going to, if that's how you want to run your locker room and your team, it's extreme. How about, how about the way the team handled it? Because they go, they beat the Leafs. And I mean, even as a big underdog last night, they still get a very valuable point by getting to OT against Carolina. I'm not shocked that they managed to get three out of four points there. Um, but, you know, the, the the team's play as a whole has been awful for about two weeks. So maybe it was, I, I don't know, I, I think there's a part of me that thinks this is like the the Mike Keenan school of mind games. And feels for like whatever, it. for whatever reason, Torts felt like, you know what, I got my hand over the nuclear button here and I got I got to pull my last card and, and see how see how the guys respond to it. And they give them credit. Like they have responded in a big way. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be fascinated to see what happens. I mean, they play Saturday afternoon against Boston, a team that historically massacres them in afternoon games on the weekend. Um, so I'll be intrigued to see if Coots gets back in for that one and not only gets back in, but, you know, how, how many minutes is he going to get? Who are his line mates? Um, the other kind of part about this that I, I, I think is, you know, maybe why the NHL is a step behind other leagues and, and specifically the NBA here is that I, I think Couturier could have used a handful of game management days because for a dude that has spent two plus years battling back surgeries and rehabbing to get back into it, it looks exhausted out there. And you wonder if maybe giving him a few maintenance days over the last couple of months might have negated the need to go through the circus this oh, week. Maybe off that's what Torts is doing. But then just say it. Like, just like <laughs> that's the dumb thing about it. Like if, if that's his reasoning. Just come out there and say it and be honest. So I, I, I don't know, but it's working. I've, I've been on. I, I've surprisingly been on the tort side of things all season long. Um, this and maybe one or two other things is one of the few that I've kind of disagreed on. But again, kind of, kind of hard to argue with the results, right? Like they're twelve games away from clinching one of the more unexpected playoff spots in quite some time. Hey, uh, just before we go, we're going to get back to some more puck talk with uh, Billick coming up right away. And uh, the latest from New York with Mike McIntyre will kind of be on uh, top of what he's got and potentially might have audio by the end of the show. How's your bracket? Did you rip it up after oh, day one? Fade me. <laughs> just fade. I'll, I should give you my the whole thing? I don't know if I picked. I don't know if I picked a game right yesterday. It was, <laughs> it was, it was, it's one of those where your bracket's so bad that you, you kind of laugh. Like I'm not even upset about it at all. Actually, we we do a family one. My mom only got one pick wrong yesterday. She she almost she's almost it's crushing always a the way that it works. Right yeah. So yeah, whatever. McNeese State failed me. Drake failed me. Schools that I had never heard of until four days ago are now dead to me. Um. So yeah, if, if anybody if anybody wants some sure winners, let me know. Hit me up, and I'll give you my my bracket for who's going to win today. Just I I would strongly suggest everybody fade me right now. I love it. Uh, just looking, and uh, Ray Ray is uh, number one in the WST group right now, and he's got Tennessee winning the entire thing. It's wild looking. Everyone seems to have a different champion for the most part. So, uh, well, we we'll get going. We'll at least love something to watch tonight on the tube. Tons of games, and then uh, back to business tomorrow afternoon with the Jets in New York to take on the Islanders. Rookie, have an awesome weekend, man. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks you too, guys. We'll talk soon. Folks, uh, you can check out Skates and Plates. Make sure you're subscribing and getting the latest content that uh, Brandon and Tyson are cranking out on the Winnipeg Jets, the National Hockey League, and much, much more. We are going to stay with the Jets. We'll see if we can get the latest from New York, courtesy of Mike McIntyre, who's there in practice with the Winnipeg Jets, and talk about it coming up next with Scotty Billick of the Winnipeg Sun. I want to extend a huge thanks to the great people at Princess Auto for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Of course, Princess Auto proudly founded right here in Winnipeg and committed to Winnipeg with their headquarters, national headquarters right here, uh, not only supporting Winnipeg Sports Talk, but all of our local teams, including the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, as they welcome fans to Princess Auto Stadium this year to cheer on the blue and gold down at the U of M. Uh, Princess Auto, of course, is the place where you'll find the best deals on the most incredible and unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them in-store on Panit Road or Portage Avenue West. 
And you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Uh, we also want to thank the folks at Wallace and Wallace. Speaking of getting ready for spring, you know Wallace and Wallace are the fencing and overhead door specialist. You'll see their fences and trucks all over the city. And for all of your fencing needs, Wallace and Wallace has you covered. What you might not know is that they're also the overhead door specialist in Winnipeg with the largest selection in Manitoba as the Clopay dealer here in town. They can also help you, though, with your maintenance, with the crazy weather, getting cold, getting warm again. This is the time to prevent downtime going into the new seasons. Give Wallace & Wallace a call to book your maintenance and inspection service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know. That is Wallace and & Wallace. And speaking of the change of the seasons, fellas, I think a lot of you may be looking into the closet and realize it might be time to up that menswear game. Well, whether you need a suit for a particular event or just want to upgrade your uh, workwear and more, F Apparel is the spot. Um, just an incredible selection of custom menswear waiting for you, starting with suits beginning at $400 along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an amazing selection of menswear accessories. If you are getting married or in a wedding party coming up this summer, make sure to talk to the fellas at F about a 15% discount when the entire wedding party uh, gets your suits at F Apparel. They've also got great deals for high school grads as well, so make sure to talk to the guys at F about that. Um, pop by and see them, 190 Smith Street downtown. You can also find out more online or make an appointment at F. That's ephapparel.com. And as we look ahead to spring and summer, I am counting down the days to fishing season. And you know on Winnipeg Sports, when we're talking fishing, we're getting fired up to head back to Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge. A one-of-a-kind, incredible fly and fishing experience right here in Manitoba, where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg. And as incredible as the world-class fishing is that awaits guests at Aikens Lake, the hospitality of the Aikens team and the Turen family is even better. Head on over to AikensLake.com. Find out more about everything available at Aikens coming up. And you can contact them as well about pricing and availability options and booking dates for the 2024 fishing season. AikensLake.com online and make sure to check them out on all their social channels at Aikens Lake. All right, good stuff. And hey, speaking of fishing, uh, our friends at Aikens have a couple openings for guides this summer. So if you know any young fishing nuts or aficionados that would love to spend the summer out in paradise, get over to uh, AikensLake.com and uh, connect with Pitt to rent on that. And uh, they are booking now more in the second half of summer, uh, July, August, September, but they do have a late opening for Father's Day weekend. So if you're thinking about an amazing father-son trip or uh, maybe a family uh, outing uh, for the big day in the weekend, talk to Aikens. As I said, that uh, is a time that's usually booked well in advance. But I just switched something around, so I thought I'd let you know about that. Hey, just Billick's coming in in just a second. But, Remo, speaking of fishing, our guy Gussie's looking to defend the Bassmasters this weekend. Yeah, Bassmaster Classic. Uh, taking place this weekend, and Jeff Gustafson uh, from Kenora, who's been on this show, won it last year, and uh, it was a pretty awesome, life-changing uh, win for him, looking to defend his title. It's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm navigating the Bassmaster website, Huss. Yes. Uh, the leaderboard hasn't been updated. They do have a live feed. Oh, apparently there's fantasy fishing. I should have got my – would have put him in my lineup <laughs> if I would have known. Okay, fantasy – Bassmaster Fantasy. Oh, we really messed up on How this. How did we not get a team in this? Oh, we can you bet on bat? Could we have thrown down? Does Cool Bet have odds? On I don't bat? think Cool Bet has Bassmasters, but I. <laughs> so I have to talk to P. Greggy and the fellows. They're usually pretty good about getting yeah. things out, but I've never seen fishing odds on the site, unfortunately. Yeah. Anyways, uh, Dave's Heavy Eyes in chat says, is Big Buff in it too? We did have the Big Buff sighting last year. When he won, 
He's part of Gussie's entourage. Yeah, we'll have to see if he's there. So we're keeping an eye on it. The, clicking on the leaderboard doesn't have anything yet, but we're watching this. The, be the best part about that with when Gussie won or was basically in the lead as you recall, Buff's wife just went, took him to the airport, mm -hmm. dropped him off. He jumped on a flight to get there and literally just showed up in shorts, a t-shirt, and flip-flop. Like, he didn't bring anything. <laughs> yeah. Except probably, hopefully his wallet. Someone had a uh, hoodie that they gave yeah, him, too. Well, yeah. <laughs> it didn't even exactly have it. Exactly. Afterwards, just vintage, vintage Buff. <laughs> Anyways, good luck to Jeff Gustafson. Hopefully, we'll be talking to another big win for our pal coming up on Monday. All right. Let's... Uh, Continue our Jets talk looking ahead to the weekend with Scott Billick of the Winnipeg Sun. You can read all his work uh, covering the Winnipeg Jets in the Sun. And, of course, make sure you're subscribing to his OnlyFans as well. Billick, what's going on? How are you? Hey, the OnlyFans. Yeah, I had to, had to log into that this morning to, <laughs> to update some photos of uh, yeah parts of me. that Yeah, anyway, I was checking out this Bassmaster website. I don't know if I've ever gone to this website. Looks like weigh-in, though, is uh, one hour and 21 minutes away, so I assume that's when the, the leaderboard will start kicking in. Perfect. So. We'll finish up WST and then get onto the Bassmaster <laughs> site and see we what uh, see the poundage yeah. coming in from day one at the, uh, at the Classic. I mean, I don't know if we need to spend too much time talking about last night. We sure. did off the top of the show. Yeah. Uh, Brandon as well. Uh, I, I thought we got all we needed from Brendan Dillon, who was uh, yeah. uh, used the word unacceptable. You liked them owning it the way he was, but he was like visibly, visibly pissed off in that uh, yeah. in that post game scrum um, with uh, a lost opportunity against a team on the other side of the playoff line. Yeah, and, you know, I was th I've been thinking about this since last night, Huss. I'm trying to figure out, okay, like I mean, like we've seen guys get angry after games, but like Brendan Dillon was rattled right like he was rattled after that that game and i'm trying to think okay like well you know here's a guy who's been to the stanley cup final so he knows what it, it takes to get there at least and he hasn't hasn't gotten over the over the hump yet but i'm just thinking like if you're brendan Dillon and or you're anybody on that team like you look at how they played against the rangers and then you, you and then and you look how they played against the devils and it's like the tale of two cities right jekyll and hyde whatever you want to call it and, and and, and my, I guess the worry would be, and the thing that I could like think about in my mind is, okay, you get to game six of a playoffs, a playoff series, you're down 3-2, right? You play a hell of a game to force a game seven. There's a big emotional win, all that stuff. But the last thing you need after a game, emotional game six win to force a game seven is a letdown in game seven. And I, I, I'm not saying that like these two games are game six and game seven, but you don't want to see that sort of letdown now if you're going to have to figure it out in the playoffs. I mean, and so, I mean, that's the first thing that I kind of was sort of like mulling over in my mind. Like, is he just upset because you, you, you want to see, <clears throat> well, you want to see the consistency, of course, right? Um, but you don't want to see a letdown like that after a big win because, you know, you're going to have big wins in the playoffs and sometimes you're going to be forced into winning a game which would be a huge game probably for your season. Um, and and then you might have to go out again two nights later and play the same sort of game. And so if I'm Brendan Dillon, I mean, I can understand why he was upset. And I think it was good for him to come out there and kind of say immediately that that was effing unacceptable because it was, right? Like I might think, and, and uh, credit, to, credit to the guys that did come out and talk. Again, I don't know. I assume all those guys were asked for. Um, but credit to them for not sitting there and being like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. It, it, like, it, they, didn't, they didn't take it nonchalantly, let's just no, say they that. Owned it. Like, they it owned was, it, and that's what they you want. It. You and want that you want level see. of accountability yeah. and just exactly. honesty when it comes down to it. That was something yeah. that wasn't a, uh, wasn't a characteristic enough for my liking in previous years and administrations. Yeah. Yeah. That has been the case, though, through the uh, the Bones era. And uh, listen, that's going to happen. I, I won't go as far as really being too worried about what a loss like that means for the playoffs because yeah, it's more you're the playing the same it, team. Right? Yeah. You're playing the same team night after night. I mean, it's like one massive head-to-head, -head, two-week sure. war. Um, it's more likely to happen when you go off such a high beating a team like the Rangers and then, you know, in the midst of a really busy time, you know, uh, dropping one. 
that being said, if we're talking a Monday about a team that, you know, didn't really show up or look more like the Jersey team than the Rangers team against the Islanders and Capitals, then we'll, uh, you know, have more to talk about. And listen, you know, this is a weird weekend with the timing of the games and the back-to-back finishing up this long stretch. Holy smokes, is next week going to be awesome, though? Edmonton, yeah. Vegas here, a Saturday night game against Ottawa. Before, as I mentioned earlier, I think, at least from a Jets perspective, we'll have a much better idea of um, how realistic winning the Central Division is, getting that banner and getting to play one of the wildcard teams after the following week when they take a trip right through the meat of the Central Division with Minnesota, Nashville, Dallas, and then the Avalanche, the final boss at the end of that that trip. Yeah, and I think that's going to probably – that trip settles the division, right? Like I've got to think then – and I think, I guess, I guess if you're the Jets too, you're sort of upset that the, you had these games in hand on these teams and you didn't really manage to, you know, pull out any sort of lead, right? Like, I mean, they're in the lead based on regulation wins right now, but they're level on games now with the Avalanche. And I mean, Dallas has one game in, or they have one game in hand on Dallas. So, and they have way more regulation wins. Like, I, I guess for the Jets, one of the things that as tight as this division is right now, if it stays this tight heading into, I don't know, the final game of the season, let's say, or they stay tied after after all 82 games are played, the Jets have the Jets have won 39 games now in regulation. So 39 of their 44 wins, only five of them haven't come uh, in regulation. That, that's a big number right now. It's one of the, the top numbers in the league, if not the top number in the league now, after after they beat the Rangers the other day. they have a, I think they have an eight-game lead on Dallas in that first tiebreaker, right? So... Um, and then the Avalanche, it's, I think it's just a two-game lead right now. But given how tight this, this division has been this year, you've got to think that it might come down to a tiebreaker at some point, whether it's for second place, whether it's for first place, whatever it might be. Um, so that, that's an interesting thing to keep track of, too. But you're right. I mean, they get back on this road trip. They need to – and so you beat Edmonton. That's a big game. You've got to come two nights later and try and beat Vegas, you know. And, and that's so that, that's – it's a big test coming up for this Jets team. Probably going to settle the division, in my opinion. Even though I just ranted on, you know, this potentially being really tight. But you know, I think you gotta, you gotta think that you gotta go and beat those teams, and you gotta figure out a way. Like I think the biggest game for them coming up is going to be that Dallas game, right? Like they gotta figure out a way to beat this Dallas team before they head into the playoffs, because it, it, it's quite possible. They play Dallas in the first round, and it's the only real team that they haven't. I think it's beaten maybe the most season. likely matchup. It could be the most likely matchup. What a great city to go and play playoff games, especially in, in mid-April. Um, what a tremendous city. I love Dallas. Um, but aside from that, yeah, I mean, I think it, it might be. And you want a good feeling because it's the last time you're going to get to play this team this season, uh, in the regular season at least. And they've struggled. They've struggled against this team. And I thought their, their earlier games this year, at least there was a chance in those games. But the last couple, they just haven't had really a chance in those games. Dallas has as 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 as, as suffocating as they, they can be, they're really good against the Jets. And the Jets haven't really figured out a way to punch through that neutral zone against this team. So yeah, that's gonna be a big game. Obviously a bunch more before it, though. Um you'd like to beat Edmonton. Who knows? You could play Vegas in the first round. You never know, just because of how you know bad Vegas is playing these days, really not really hope winning. That Vegas, I really hope Vegas actually wins enough to get into third. Like I want to see Edmonton Vegas go at it in the first round. Well, yeah, and I, mean, I, think, I think whoever you're... wins the division would probably feel better playing the Kings than playing the Golden Knights. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you, especially if Mark Stone just like rips off the bandage after uh, on game <laughs> the day after eighty two. That's happening. No, I don't think it's happening either. But it would be pretty funny, right? It would also be sort of interesting to watch a team that's got. I think their cap hit as today is around like ninety seven million or something like that. Um, a team like that, like basically a $100 million team not make the playoffs, that would also be quite the storyline. Not that you really want to see the Vegas Golden Knights out of the playoffs because they have so much talent on that team, and they're just a good team, right? Like, oh, you like I'd be team. fine with that. I'd well, be fine I know, I know. yeah, I, I, t- I totally get it. I know a lot of fans would love to not see Vegas in the playoffs, and I think it'd be pretty funny because you remember all the Kucherov shirts and all that. Well, you could make some pretty funny Vegas shirts if they miss the playoffs with a, with a $100 million team there. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, I, I think again for the Jets. I mean, if they want, if they want to do that, and, and maybe and help Minnesota a little bit because it's probably Minnesota that, that that's going to be the team that would be the ones that that can kind of 
I guess, catch them. Um, and, and, or maybe St. Louis. I mean, there's St. Louis is there too. I think it's four and five points, something like that. Um, between them, Calgary's still in the mix, although they're like 10 points back. So probably not still in the mix. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, that should be interesting to watch, but you know, they could do it. I mean, if the Jets go next week and beat Vegas, I mean, that could be a, that could be a big thing. And maybe, maybe, maybe later in the, It'd be interesting to see what happens because they play Minnesota later, like in April, don't they? At the Jets, I believe. Yeah, they're the first. They're they play. It's the <laughs> sixth in Minnesota, so, <laughs> the ninth in Nashville, eleventh in Dallas, thirteenth in uh, Colorado. Right. So uh, that would be such an interesting. You know how many times like this? I'm just. I love the storylines. Right. This is part of our job. And but can you imagine going into Minnesota and Minnesota's like neck and neck with Vegas for the final playoff spot? Then what do you do if you're the Jets, right? Like, do you really want to stick it to Vegas and just let Minnesota take that game? Do you want Minnesota in the first round because you hate Minnesota and you don't like Ryan Hartman and all that stuff there? Like, I, I just, I, I think it, it'd be very intriguing to see what, the, I, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in the, that dressing room if it ever comes down to that because you don't like both teams, but I don't know which one. You'd probably rather play Minnesota in the first round if, if you know, if that's the case. Uh, the only thing is, Vegas. if you're losing those games, you're probably not winning the division, which well, probably means thing, you're right? in the there's two, so three, many, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, so I'll tell you what, I don't think Minnesota's <laughs> going to be there. And if the Jets could go into Minnesota, beat them again, sweep yeah. the season series, and essentially help put a little more dirt on their grave. I think most Jet fans right. would be fine with that because, let's face it, I think the Vegas Golden Knights are going to be in the playoffs. And yeah. listen, everyone's talking about their, their LTIR. They're third in the NHL. Yeah. Like, there's two teams with more than that. One yeah. is Tampa. Yeah. And you know who the number one team is? No one talks about that at all. I, you could tell me. I don't know. The Leafs. The Leafs, yeah, of course. The yeah, Leafs, the Leafs have, like, five guys totaling seven over $17 million on uh, yeah. the LTIR yeah. and a cap well, hit at just about $98 million. I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I'll I'll pull this up right now. You can think about some of these guys that are on LTIR. Oh. Jake Muzzin, right. five point six. Matt Murray, four point six. <laughs> John Klingberg. Remember, he all of a sudden just sucked yeah. for a bit. And we're like, ah, yeah, he shut down. He can't play for the rest of the year. Yeah. Cal Yarncroak and uh, and Mark Giordano as well. So, yeah. Um, and I don't think any of those guys are projected to come back. That yeah, is the one they thing. They're, like, they're, today's cap hit is $99.5 million. The good point yeah. us. Well, yeah, you're right. We don't talk about the Leafs enough on this. I was just, yeah, looking at that. That's great. Yeah, that's odd. They got five guys, 17.3. That's insane. <laughs> I, uh, but, you know, I mean, just bringing it back to the Jets in this weekend. Yeah. Um, it's sort of fascinating and probably not good for the Islanders um, in the fact that they've been really struggling. They won six in a row. I think they've lost another six or seven in a row now going into tomorrow night. And they're going to have, I would imagine, if we've, if we've learned anything from this Jets team, I mean, I'll give them credit for bouncing back and being much better after performances like that like that last night. Um, and yeah. they've been great on the second end of back-to-backs. They were 6-0. and oh, before uh, that game in Vancouver a couple weekends ago. So, I mean, important for Winnipeg to get back in it, grab some more points, and really get ready to uh, move up to play with the big boys next week on home ice when Edmonton and Vegas come here. Um, but two opponents that, like Jersey, should be, not sure they necessarily will be, but should be desperate playing for their lives right now, although yeah. we certainly haven't seen that from Pat Roy's team over the last two weeks. No, it's been a yeah, it's been a tough tough slide for them. They had a really good start when 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 Patrick came in and and caught and and you know took over the reins there as the coach after Lane Lambert was canned. Um, but yeah, I mean it, it's interesting, right? Because it, this could go one of two ways. I mean, it could go the way that it went last night, where the Jets kind of get caught off uh, off guard by a, a desperate team. Um, you know, New Jersey. I mean, and this kind of illuminates just how difficult it is. The you know the Devils came in into the day, six points back of the Red Wings, and they get a big win against the Jets, and they're still six points back of the Red Wings. It's so difficult to, to make up ground here, right? And now you got the Islanders. They're five points back, just as difficult to make up ground. And then you got the Capitals, who are only three points and probably feeling like they can do it because the Capitals got three games or two games in hand on, on Detroit. So, you know, technically, as of right now, they control their own playoff destiny. 
Um, but they've also lost one. But they've, they you know, it, it's it's a weird situation there because all those teams have not really played very well. You look at all of them. I think they're all below five hundred in their last ten games. Uh, you you mentioned the Islanders. I, I think they're what are they? Oh, five and two. I think in their last seven, something like that. Like it's been bad for them. Um, but yeah, this is the thing. Like the Jets just got to come out. Like I mean. I think part of what Brendan Dillon did last night too was kind of issue a bit of a warning or a wake up call to his team because they know they're going into this weekend against two more teams that, as you said, should be desperate, right? Should be desperate to get those points. They need them, right? Just to keep pace, just to give themselves a chance. Um, and you know, if I'm if I'm the Jets, I mean, I'm looking at that Washington game as good as they played Washington a couple weeks ago now, where they beat them three nothing, shut them out and how bad Washington looked in that game. Um, you know, you still got to be wary of them because, because I mean, they, whatever, they're just, I don't think the Washington Capitals probably think they have a huge chance to get in. And and they're sort of just playing a game that, you know, they don't they don't really need to, it, it's just more of a carefree game, right? Like, I don't think they're, they're really feeling the pressure at this point. They, you know, they, they, they sold some guys off at the deadline and that sort of thing. So, Nobody's really sort of expecting them to get back into it. But, you know, Detroit's sort of not uh, taking the reins here and let them go. So, I mean, some of these teams are feeling feeling like they probably still have a bit of a chance, I guess. But, yeah, I mean, the Jets should walk into this week and, 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 and take four out of four points. Like, I mean, that's, that's what they should do. They should be able to use both of their goaltenders. Obviously, I mean, I thought Lauren Brassois, despite, you know, eating three last night. He was he unreal played a hell last of a game. night. Yeah, he was very good. Um, and so, you know, and I think you got Connor Hellebuck coming off a 40 save, uh, a game as well. I think they, they, oh, they knocked it down to 39. In. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, you have two goalies, so you, all you got to do is play better in front of them. Right. Like this is the one thing about this Jets team. And what the reason why they were so damn good in the first half of the year is because they had both of their goalies. I mean, outside the first three or four games, they had both of their goalies going really well. And so when you have both your goalies going really well and you're playing that good in front of them, they were, they were almost unbeatable on, on a lot of nights. Um, now, you know, you're, you're, it's not like you're leaving it to your goalies to save the game, but in the last two, and especially last night, um, you know, it, that one was definitely a game where, you know, they, they sort of hung Lauren Brasol out to dry. And, and I mean, he, he played really well. one game, and I know I see it in oh, the no, chat, I'm not too. Trying to, like, you can't it, overreact too much. I mean, they'd won three in a no. row. I think they'd scored 15 goals uh, and yeah, given up yeah. three in their last two. Very and and good, listen, yeah. moved up and really answered the challenge of the Rangers. Um, but, I mean, listen, the Rangers, you knew there was going to be a big push, and they put a ton of pucks on Hellebuck in that third period. And it is the first time since 2019 They've given up back-to-back 40-shot nights. Right. That is not part of the equation. I joked, and we've learned now, that Bones is not going to join the club. He'll meet them back in Winnipeg when they return. But I did joke that he was maybe right after the game on his way to JRI to get on a 5 a.m. flight so he could be there for practice to let everybody know his feelings for what had happened. Yeah. Speaking of which, this is just a quick update um, from uh, Scott Arneal, courtesy of our pal Mike McIntyre. Ehlers is fine. They gave him a maintenance day, uh, um, and Cole Perfetti was in on his line. Good news for you Perfetti fans, he is back in tomorrow. Now, it was not clear who comes out, where he'll be playing, but if you've been waiting for Cole to get a chance to get back into the lineup, tomorrow is going to be that day. Um, No surprise that Schmidt goes back in for Miller. Uh, Hellebuck is going to start. And, you know, as I touched on this a little earlier with uh, with Reem right off the hop, uh, Scott, but... Like the last two games that Miller's played have been, you know, the two downers, the Nashville game and this game against Jersey last night. I think it's pretty clear right now that Logan Stanley and Colin Miller are the 7-8 defensemen right now. And when the puck drops on the playoffs, we will see the group that Scott Arneal is going to be putting out against the Islanders tomorrow, which includes Nate Schmidt. Yeah, and I think Nate Schmidt's really handled this well. I talked to him. I wrote a story a couple weeks back, a week and a half ago on Nate Schmidt, had a good chat with him. He talked about how he sat down with Rick Bonus back in December. They had a beer, maybe maybe one or two, maybe three or four, but that, in San Jose, um, when when they when they sat Nate Schmidt for those two games in, in mid-December there. And I think since then, and Nate talked about it, it's like, okay, well, they just needed to get on the same page because Nate was trying to play his way of playing the hockey. 
and it, but it wasn't really, you know, jibing with, with Rick bonuses, what he wanted. And so they both kind of got back on the same page. So when, when Nate went out of the lineup last, well, earlier this month, and, and he's been out of the lineup in and out of it, um, it, it wasn't, again, it wasn't a play thing at that point. They were, you know, they knew and they knew they wanted to get, and Nate was made aware that they wanted Logan Stanley to play a few more games. And then obviously when Colin Miller got brought in, I mean, that was a depth move. But Nate Schmidt's handled this brilliantly, right? I mean, I think his partnership with Dylan Sandberg um, has really uh, blossomed over this season, and 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 it's been it's been really good. Like those two play really well together. Um, and I don't, you know, Sandberg's obviously very good defensively, but I think they just like they're, they're, one's not pulling up the other or, or vice versa, right? It, it both guys just really play well together. They have a great off ice relationship, basically you know, like master protege kind of there um, between those two. So, yeah, I think Nate Schmidt's handled it brilliantly. He's played really well when he's played. And I think when Nate Schmidt looks back at this, I think some of this rest that he's getting um, is going to be healthy for him, right? Like I think this is going to help him come into the playoffs a little more fresh than maybe some of the other guys who are going to play all 82 or, you know, we'll see how it goes. But I think it's I think it's good for him. And, yeah, you know, just to touch on Perfetti, um, yeah, I mean, I – probably sat out a little longer than he probably should have, but you're also winning, right? I mean, we're, we're seeing this in Philadelphia with, with Sean Couturier, the captain of the team, being sat for two straight games. And, you know, and part of that is because they're, they're we're winning, right? Um, you know, they, they lose last night in overtime, uh, the Flyers, so we'll probably see Couturier go back in. But a lot of guys, a lot of teams don't like to mess with a winning lineup, right? And so it's a lot easier to bring Cole back in now um after 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 the loss uh, on, on on thursday there so yeah uh you know i expect cole to come in but i think cole knows the score right now right i mean i think everybody sort of knows the score with with cole i mean he's sort of on the outside he's probably that 13th guy come playoff time assuming everybody's healthy assuming gabe velarde is back if he is back i mean i know we saw the 32 thoughts and the jets are all hoping that that gabe or he's trending i guess uh, you know, to be, to return this. They're year. expecting him to expecting be available. Him, yeah, by we'll see what that time. means. We've <laughs> one thing that we've learned about Rick Bonus is you know when you, when a guy's day to day, he could be month to month, right? So <laughs> you never know what's going to happen, but we'll see. I mean, I don't know. Again, I don't know the timeline on a large spleen, but I don't even know if it's as much the large spleen because I'm sure they can. They, they've probably found at this point <clears throat> what the cause of that is. But it's whatever that injury was that actually got them to find that enlarged spleen. That's the one that I'd be more, I don't know if I'm worried about, but just curious about. Like, you know, what is it? Is he, has he healed from that now? Are they just waiting on the spleen? Do they need to? I mean, I assume if they're saying that they expect him to come back, it doesn't sound like that you would need a surgical kind of procedure there. Because I think if you're taking out a spleen or, or whatever, it's, it's like three to six months, kind of that sort of thing. So if you're expecting him back, well, it's it's like a month today. I think I think the playoffs start on April twenty second, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this year. So they got a month today um, for the playoffs to begin. So yeah, um, yeah. I, I think Cole Perfetti coming in is going to be a good thing for him. I, I you, you want to see a good game out of Cole Perfetti for sure. It's, it's, his his I yeah. mean, the challenge for him is to is to be able to um, hang with the style that the Jets are playing and show that you know yeah. he can be an option for them. Like, you know, does he make sense on the fourth line? To me, not really. No. Um, Where else but listen, go, if Velarde right? is out, I mean, there could be um, an opportunity at some point yeah. to go in back where he was on that second line, and, you know, you're going to need to be ready. So, you know, yeah. it, the the, te- the test will be for Cole when he gets in during the rest of this regular season to put his best foot forward um, and um, let the coaching staff know that he's good to go and uh, hopefully in a better place than he was before. Yep. One more for you, though, and yep. speaking of the lineup, as we look ahead to the playoffs, the more I watch the fourth line as has been going as of late, the more I think that Gus is in, in the top 12. I mean, yeah. his two-way game, his defensive acumen, yep. that is really important for the fourth line, and I think they've been as effective as they looked in a long time, especially the way he and Barron have been going. Vlad's been sort of up yep. and down, but he can do so many different things. To me, I, I, if I was putting the lineup, the lineup includes David Gustafson in the middle. Yeah, I think I think it's right. I think Gabe, again, we're talking about guys who've really handled some, oh. some, I guess, adversity well. 
David Gustin. My, and again, for listeners, if you've never, if you've never even had a chance to sort of talk to David Gustin, even get an autograph for him or whatever, like super salty earth guy, like maybe the nicest guy, almost too nice. Like you almost don't want an NHL player to be that nice. Um, <clears throat> but he is, right? I mean, that's the one thing about David Gustafson. But I, I think that speaks a lot to his attitude, to, to, to the way that that guy handles the ups and downs of being a young player, a young sort of bubble player in the lineup. He's dealt with a, a, you know, a crap ton of injuries over the last few years, right? Um, and, and he's handled it all so brilliantly. And, and when he's playing, like, it, it, it very rarely do you see that guy make a, a, a mistake and come playoff time, right? If you need your fourth line to, you know, eat some minutes or whatever, but the biggest thing that you want from that that guy, and especially your fourth line center, is that ability to grind out down low, to grind a shift down, to to forecheck hard, to back check hard, like all the you know the I guess the fundamentals of hockey, um, you know, for a grindy line like a fourth line that just has uh, got to go out there and kind of just alleviate some of the pressure from the top two or three lines. Um, you get that with David Gustafson, and he's brilliant on the penalty kill, very good. In that, I mean, last night, uh, you know, notwithstanding, um, but you know, like they just they have a really good player in David Gustafson. It's just been a struggle for him, right? It's been a struggle for him to stay healthy, and when he's not healthy, you know, other guys have come up, and you know, I, I, they were always going to give a long runway to to Rasmus Kapari because of the fact that they traded for him, and you know, you figure out you could maybe rebuild him or whatever. Gus is, you know. Gus is oh, considerably I'm getting, ahead. I'm getting all. Gus yeah, is considerably but, ahead of Rasmus as far as oh, I wouldn't be surprised oh, if Rasmus gets yeah. in there. I mean, he can he can fly, yeah. but just not a lot of other things happening. But yeah, exactly. you know, hey, it gives us a lot to focus on for 13 more games. You know, especially with these back to backs, we'll see some guys get in. Yeah. Um, but I just I just wanted to put it out there. I think Gus has done enough to earn the confidence of the coaches. Yeah. Uh, he is, is, I mean really really good in his own end and that yeah. is important and you know what they've been great on the cycle too he's got a good connection with baron and i think that mix with vlad will be good and if Velarde does come back then they'll have a difficult decision as to what the yeah, best fit is though. because all of a sudden you've got alex iafalo who 100 percent is in the lineup as well so first things first yeah. though ranger or islanders caps this weekend and uh Hopefully our brackets can survive another night. We'll watch some March Madness tonight and uh, get going. Billick, yeah. great stuff as you always. Should. Have an awesome weekend, buddy. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. Yeah, you, you two guys. I'll be uh, I'll be uh, on this Bassmaster site now. We yes, let's go, Gussie. How fat these fish are. So that'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right on. There is uh, Scott Billick of the Winnipeg Sun. Um, all right, just past two thirty. If you're with us live on YouTube. We will be opening up Marvel's registration in about 10 minutes, so pay attention to the chat, and you'll know when uh, it's open. You put in exclamation mark Marbles in about 10 minutes, and that will happen while we speak to our Friday regular and our favorite. Coming up next is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. And as we get ready for the playoffs and the playoff excitement increases do not forget winnipeg jet fans that you can get priority access and count yourself in for the entire 2024 playoffs right now by putting down a deposit on season tickets or ticket packages for the upcoming 2024 2025 season head on over to winnipegjets.com deposit a full list of the benefits of being a season ticket member or ticket package holder for the upcoming seasons there, map and pricing and more. And if you do it now, you will be in the same seat for all of the whiteouts down at Canada Life Center, hopefully for a long and very fun playoff, uh, playoff run for the Winnipeg Jets. Again, right now, the We're All In campaign continues. It's winnipegjets.com slash deposit for more on that. And while speaking of the playoffs, probably a trip down to Royal Sports is going to be necessary as everyone gets their whites ready for the Winnipeg Jets and whoever they're playing come April. There is simply no better sports store anywhere than Royal Sports. And if you're a Winnipeg Jet fan, thousands of pieces of Jets merchandise, whites and otherwise, 
all of the jerseys and still plenty of time to get your jersey customized with your favorite player, name, number, just in time for the postseason. So much more than just Jets merch as well, though, at Royal. Tons of bomber gear, Major League Baseball, with Jays starting up right now, NFL and more. The biggest hockey section in town, all of the spring sports loading in by the day, and tons of cool stuff on the King Skate Snow and Surf side. Pop by and see it for yourself. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. And make sure to give them a follow on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And speaking of those playoffs, I mean, if you're not in the building or the team is on the road, you know the best place to get together with your gang to watch the big game is your local Boston pizza. All the Jets games on the big screen with big sound, not to mention those ice-cold schooners, world-famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and some great new treats on the BP appetizer menu. There's simply nothing like getting together at your local BP. And if you are staying at home, though, you can get the great taste of Boston pizza by ordering online at bostonpizza.com. You train day in and day out, learning new techniques, approaching new concepts, and living out the thrill of achieving your goals. Building a craft beer is no different. While you spend your hours on the ice, we spend ours here. Brewing our trademark beer. Again, again, and again. Here's to pushing the status quo and challenging ourselves to build something memorable. 1919 by Little Brown Jug. All right, it's an auto Friday episode of WST without the NFL notebook and more, much more, particularly today. With Hacksaw himself, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton joins us now. Lee, how are you doing, buddy? Nice to hear from you. Are there enough hours in the day to cover everything that we need to cover from obviously what's going on around the NFL on the owners' meetings and free agencies to what's going on in March Madness and basketball and now the crisis among crisis in Major League Baseball? Wow. Well, listen, we have to start off with Otani. I mean, before you get, I'm going to get into the details of what we know right now as of today. What was your initial reaction when you first heard what is being alleged of four and a half million dollars of gambling losses so closely tied to the number one superstar in the sport? Uh, first item, the light bulb went on and I said, is this him or is it his accomplice that was doing all this? Second item, because he's such a reclusive person, a.k.a. Howard Hughes, anything is possible. And now we sit here hours after the story changed. We have to sort out who's lied, who's told the truth, what did he know, when did he know it, what did he do about it? And then there's, there's the tentacles of the story, Andrew, are spreading everywhere. You know, this investigation involving this Orange County illegal bookmaker has been going on since 2017. They've encompassed a lot of different gambling people that have been linked to this guy. This guy's got tentacles, I believe, into the sports world. So the question is, and this is the bottom line to me, and it's going to take ages to sort it out. The question is, was Otani gambling and having this guy, Muzahaba, make the bets on his behalf? That sounds, that sounds like a big reach, but I'll tell you what, because of who he is and how he stayed away from virtually everybody, I guess anything is possible. And then the spinoff of that is, if he's such a smart guy, how could he be so naive to let this guy have access to bank accounts to transfer this money? Or what rationale did he use to say, okay, I'm going to give you my money because we're close friends and you can pay off the gambling bets when he knows every member of the Baseball Association Players Union knows you can't be affiliated with illegal gamblers. So, I mean, there are so many tentacles to the story, Hustler that are going to have to come out in a while. And this thing is expanding. The FBI is now involved. The IRS has just announced they've begun an investigation into Otani's tax status and this Japanese personal aids tax status. Uh, is there a cover-up here? You know, baseball didn't know about this, and yet everybody went to Korea and celebrated Otani and Yashimura and Yu Darvish, and Japan and Korea, and they allowed all this happen they had to have some knowledge that something was going on from the inside so this is a complex complex story right now with a ton of unanswered questions and right now a bunch of lies out there too well and that's the thing i mean uh, you know the information has changed over the last few days and i mean first things first uh, i don't know how many uh, interpreters are getting 
$4 million credit with any bookmaker, to be honest with you. So, I mean, his presence was influential in this happening, I think, no matter what. And to your point, it, there's there's a non-zero chance that he is far more implicated than what we've heard so far. But, Lee, if you could for our listeners, I mean, this story broke earlier this week, and there was one story, and by the next day, the Otani camp had very much changed the tune. Can you explain kind of how that's changed and where it's at right now as far as what they are claiming? What I've been told from people that I've canvassed is that the Los Angeles Times and the Associated Press were working on stories about this guy in Orange County. Uh, and and he, he was under a long investigation for illegal gambling ties. And usually when these, the district attorney and the prosecution does cases like that, they squeeze and squeeze the guy, and the guy leaks names to help his own cause. Uh, I was told that during the investigation, this guy had dropped hints that he had a relationship with Otani, which immediately raises a red flag. Uh, now now it's been, it's been proven since then that he never met Otani, but he was dealing with Otani's personal aid. This guy was using Otani's name to build his own street cred. That's a big issue. Then, as, as the AP and the LA Times dug deeper, they finally tracked down the personal aid and confronted him, we have this data. And the guy opened up and said, yes, uh, I, I'm in deep financial debt. I've been a gambling addict. And he made, you know, made one angle to the story was that Otani gave him the money. Then there was accusations, well, maybe after the checks were written, the transfers made, it should be put, quote, a loan rather than a payoff. Well, where's a where's personal aid going to come up with $4.5 million to pay Otani back? So the deeper it went, the story got more complex. And then the next morning, Otani's legal firm, the lawyers that represent him personally, went public and said, this is all a pack of lies. Otani had nothing to do with this. This guy accessed Otani's accounts. Now, the question is, how did he get the access codes to make the transfers on Otani's computer? Otani give it to him? Did the guy steal it? This, as I say, there's so many different layers here. And I think what complicates it is Otani's like Howard Hughes. He's so private. He's been shielded by everybody. I think there's a whole bunch of enablers here. And at the end of the day, I'll spin back to ask this question, and Rob Manfred, the commissioner, won't be happy. You went forward with this whole Korean story. You had no knowledge whatsoever. And then secondly, his legal firm had no knowledge about all this money that was no longer in certain accounts that Otani had. How is that humanly possible? So I, I don't know if it's a cover-up or whether everybody's just been an enabler to the star. Um, I will tell you this, that I would think very shortly MLB is going to have to do an intervention here, and they're going to have to take him out of the Dodger lineup, and they're going to have to put him on administrative leave. And they do that with a lot of players who get involved in a lot of trouble. And this is pretty significant. And, you know, and now when you drag the IRS into it, this is a much deeper story than – a Japanese player giving his best friend a personal advisor access to his funds and paying off gambling. It is so complicated. If I made a list, would take up the rest of your hour here, Hustler, trying to connect the dots, and then we connect the dots, and then more questions go up. Well, I mean, the, the one thing that I found very surprising is that in the last couple of days, it has been reported that Major League Baseball wasn't even going to investigate Otani. I, I don't see how that's possible moving forward right now, Lee. I, I, you know, it'd be fascinating to see if he actually does go on the commissioner's list and has to leave the lineup for any extended period of time. But the bottom line here is that, mate, I mean, even if he is the biggest international superstar in the game and the golden goose for Major League Baseball, there's no way they can just take everything at face value and move along. Can't sweep it under the rug. No, concur with you wholeheartedly, Andrew. Uh, and, and like I say, baseball's got a very good investigative group. I mean, they have they have F former retired FBI agents that run the investigative arm of Major League Baseball. You know, and, and baseball's had to deal with some really sleazy things involving players. More recently, two Dodger pitchers, Julio Urias and Trevor Bauer. Uh, and those guys all are wound up on the restricted list and faced suspensions and got suspensions. And there's no doubt that Otani is the face of Major League Baseball, the personality of Major League Baseball right now. But these are serious implications because it's with gamblers. It's illegal gamblers. 
Uh, this this is a deep, deep, dark story, and I would bet I bet he winds up on the administrative list pretty doggone quickly. And the Dodgers can't ignore it. The Dodgers can't cover it up. Uh, the, the Dodgers sealed off Otani's locker from anybody in the media. He was escorted into lo- the uh, clubhouse in Korea uh, like 50 minutes before game time, was escorted right out, not allowed to talk to anybody whatsoever. They can't hide this, and he can't be a recluse anymore because he's now public front and center. It truly is a fascinating way to get going on the Major League Baseball season after the big offseason move. Lee, let's transition over the uh, National Football League, and we'll kind of get to free agency and whatnot in a minute. But uh, lots of business happening in the offseason. The owners getting together. And uh, what are we finding out about potential rule changes, in particular to kickoffs as we know them? Well, the owners will vote next Tuesday. Competition committee has proposed a radical change in the kickoff. The Players Association is dead set against it, which I don't quite understand because this is all about safety of players more than it is anything else. What they're proposing is a rule that was used in the XFL for one year in which, Andrew, you're kicking off to me. You kick off from your own 35-yard line. But the kick cover guys, the guys go down the field to make the tackles, they line up at the opponent's 40, and my blockers on my kick return unit line up at the 35. So you got the kicker kicking long distance, the attackers at the 40, the defenders at the 35. Nobody can move till the ball's in play. So the ball is fielded by the kick return guy. There can't be gunners coming down the field trying to make the tackle at the point of of the recovery. So it's a radical change because what you're going to do is you're going to have guys standing at the line of scrimmage who can't move until our return guy starts to run the ball back it's going to lessen the impact because these guys are not going full bore down the field and guys getting blasted into other guys. Uh, it's, it's a safety move. 25% of the major injuries come on that one singular play, kick or punt return. So it's being proposed. The union is against it. The Players Association is saying you're taking a, an important part out of kick returns because that's a piece of NFL history. I also indirectly think the union doesn't want to see this happen because it's going to mean that maybe might might be one or two less roster spots for guys who are just strictly kick return guys because, you know, the kick return value may be different. Well, that's what I was thinking. I mean, it just seems that, I mean, from a player's safety standpoint, everyone should be looking forward to try to make the game safer. But... I mean, they're on every team. There's one or two special teams demons that is one of those gunners that gets down the field that has a unique spot on the roster. And I, I would imagine, I guess, this is just protecting spots and players that have established themselves in the NFL for exactly that reason. Yeah, to me, it's more safety. Now, there's a second proposal, and this one's kind of come out of the dark alley. There's a proposal just to eliminate kickoffs completely uh, and give give the, every team the ball to 25-yard line. There won't be kickoffs after touchdowns, kickoffs, uh, to start the game, kickoffs to start the second half. That's kind of radical. That that really does change the, the rule of the game. It takes that segment of the game that's been in, in the game since the 1920s. I don't think that one's going to pass, but uh, this is a hybrid XFL rule. It'll be a one-year experiment. Um, I would do it. I, as weird as it would look, as weird as it, it seems to be executed, I would do it from a player's safety standpoint because these guys are getting blown up. I mean, the hits on the gunners coming downfield, the blockers, and then the return men at the speed they're going. Uh, it's like head-on auto crashes. So I think it's more safety than it is anything else. But it obviously will change the look of the game for certain. Are they going to touch the roster number and uh, add a QB? Uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of dialogue in the last year and a half. We had that one playoff game where the team had no quarterbacks left. Uh, 53-man active roster on Sunday. They're now going to proposal 53 plus one. The third quarterback can be in the game. He will not count against the 53 on game day. He'd be an extra player. He can only play if quarterbacks one and two are out with injuries, uh, and he would be active. Um, That's where it is. It's been discussed. I think it should pass. Why would you not want to have an insurance quarterback for the the benefit of the team that loses its top two guys? You can say, ah, it never happens. Well, it did happen. It happened most important time of the season in the NFL playoffs. So just you go ahead and do it. And these guys practice all week. They know the playbook. They run. They run the uh, you know the taxi squad and run the opposing offenses for your team. So they're they're ready to play. So I I think that one probably has a chance to go through. It's fifty three plus one. 
Lee Hacksaw Hamilton with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Lee, the uh, the carousel of free agency slowing down a little bit, but uh, still some significant uh, ads. We saw Mike Williams, who got cut by the Chargers, end up signing on with the New York Jets this week. But uh, we're over 200 players that have swapped clubs. Yeah, as of breakfast this morning when you bought coffee and donuts, 204 guys have changed teams in 10 days. It's absolutely amazing. Some of the contract numbers they're giving out are absolutely phenomenal, too. Uh, there, there are still some guys out there. You know, I didn't think of this till last night. Quarterback who's not been moved, who was expected to be moved, maybe because nobody wants him, Zach Wilson of the Jets is still there. They've been trying to trade him. They might release him, but I don't know what kind of value he's got on the open market. Carson Wentz, uh, the journeyman quarterback uh, who's been all over the league, uh, Carson Wentz is still available out there. Uh, the two star safeties from Seattle, uh, Diggs and uh, Jamal Adams, they're both unsigned. Now, they, they got issues. There are personality issues off the field with some of those guys. Some of those guys have injury issues. I mean, there's still some guys there. But, I mean, the marquee guys came off the board the first day like you wouldn't believe. And, like I said, 204 as of Friday morning. So it's it's just been phenomenal, the rate of turnover. And we go from this, and next week we'll start talking about the NFL draft and trade rumors and quarterbacks. And this sucker never, ever friends. Hey, you know, one other quarterback that we haven't mentioned that I haven't heard much on is uh, Ryan Tannehill. Still out there. A lot of age. Played really poorly. A couple of injuries back to back to back. It was thought he might go to Pittsburgh, uh, but then Pittsburgh made the moves to rent the two quarterbacks. Yeah, Pittsburgh, to me, has had the most fascinating offseason. Um, Pittsburgh has kind of come out of character as to how they're doing business. I'll throw, I'll throw you this late-breaking story. Hasn't happened yet, but it's rumored out there. First, Pittsburgh went and got Russell Wilson on a rental for $1.1 million. Denver's paying the other $39 million. He only signed a one-year deal. Uh, so it's going to be a prove-yourself year. Well, he'll give them more credibility at quarterback than they've had since Ben Roethlisberger retired. You know, and then they turned around and they made the deal for Justin Fields, whose value has really plunged through the floor. Think about him being a Chicago Bear number one draft pick, and they only got a number six for him. But if you, if you do a deep dive into his statistics, uh, unbelievable number of touchdowns, yards, ridiculous number of turnovers, fumbles, and 135 sacks in three years holding the football. So he's a, he's working projects. So, so they got him for three million. So they got two starting quarterbacks for a combined four point three million dollars for the coming season. And and here's the, here's the story that could break. Uh, San Francisco's got huge salary cap problems. Brandon Ayuk, their star big play receiver, wants a payday. Pittsburgh's got enormous amount of cap space now because they got rid of their controversial big money wide receiver Deontay Johnson. I was told Pittsburgh has already talked to Ayuk about a state-of-the-art deal, which might be 13, 14, or 15 million. Could you imagine him going to Pittsburgh with the two veteran quarterbacks, with the two running backs? I mean, change the whole persona of what Pittsburgh Steelers become, and it'd be a huge blow to San Francisco, but the Niners are up against it with salary cap problems, and Brandon Ayuk wants what Debo Samuel's getting, what Christian McCaffrey's getting. Well, San Francisco can't pay everybody. So Keep an eye on that name. If that flashes on your screen one of the days in Winnipeg Sports Talk, I told you so. You know, speaking of salary cap problems, we knew that Jim Harbaugh was walking into a situation with the Chargers that change was going to need to happen. I mean, they've moved off their two big receivers, Keenan Allen's in Chicago. They redid the deal of Mack and Bosa. What's next for the Chargers? And uh, you cover this team very closely. I mean, what do you make of uh, how – They've gone in and uh, revamped this roster, um, frankly, because they had to um, due to the cap. Well, their hand was forced. I mean, at, at one point, there were $55 million over the cap. And the cap went up, which gave them a little bit of breathing room. Uh, but then, then they had to buy out their starting center, who's got heart disease, Corey Lindsley. Uh, they released Mike Williams, whose cap figure was in the $30 million range. Uh, then, they, you know, they lost Austin Eckler. He's gone. I mean, they've gone through a radical purge of skill guys on their roster. I was disappointed that they traded Keenan Allen. I was kind of disappointed in Keenan Allen. They went to their other two big money guys, Hustler. Uh, they went to Joey Bosa. They went to Khalil Mack and said, we'd like you to take a pay cut to help us keep this team intact. And Joey Bosa gave up a $4 million roster bonus that was due this weekend. Khalil Mack gave up a $7 million roster bonus that was due uh, right around this time. 
Then they went to Keenan Allen and said, we'd like you to give up your roster bonus so we can keep the core together. And Keenan Allen said, no. He said, I've been here a long time. I played well. I got 900 career receptions. I earned this money. And they promptly the next day traded him uh, to the uh, Chicago Bears. Uh, now that now they've got to the team, I think Allen should have taken the pay cut to keep this thing together for at least another year or two. And now, as Justin Herbert had his coffee this morning, he does not have either his top two veteran wide receivers, does not have his top tight end, does not have his lead running back, Austin Eckler. And they don't have a lot of players left on the board that they're going to be able to go get. They're renting a bunch of guys on their offensive line and defensive line who are minimum wage veteran players. So it's going to be a very different team. They do have their high number one. They have a high number two. They've got multiple number threes. So it may be that Joe Hurtee is the new general manager who came from Baltimore and has a history of executing trades. He may trade out a number five and try to stockpile additional picks. But I'll tell you what, Justin Herbert drinking coffee this morning, he's got to be concerned because they've lost so many skilled people around him. Well, I'm sure he's in their ear saying, uh, well, if the quarterbacks go one, two, three as expected, uh, there's some pretty prime wide receiving talent that will be available at four and five. Although I'm sort of with you. I wouldn't be surprised if there is a move down because there will be plenty of teams trying to get, get up into that top five. Well, that or the reality, because they said a week ago at the Combine, we're going to run the football. And they went out and got Gus Edwards, who's heavy-duty running back, very different running back than Eckler. Got Gus Edwards from Baltimore. So if they're going to run the football that way, and they got a blocking tight end from Seattle, Will Disley. If you're going to do that, then that, that leads me to believe maybe with the fifth pick, they're going to take an offensive tackle, because there are two gems in the early first round. One out of uh, uh, Notre Dame, Joe Alt and one out of Penn State. They could take one of those guys at number five. If they're, if they're going to commit that we're going to pound this football and help this quarterback, then you better go get yourself a stud right tackle. And there are two of them there that are probably top 10 players. So I would think they'd do that unless somebody overwhelms them with a wild, wild number of draft picks and says, hey, trade down a couple of slots and we'll give you additional choices because we want to get access to one of these quarterbacks. And the bidding, the bidding on picks three, four, and five are probably going to be fierce. New England doesn't have a quarterback yet. They're taking offers on number three. Arizona does have a quarterback. They'd like to trade out because they need so much help. So number four could be in play. And then the Chargers at number five. So it's going to be fascinating. And if you look down your board on your draft board, Hustler, you're, you're looking at a situation where you got Denver needs a quarterback. Minnesota needs a quarterback. The Raiders need a quarterback. And all those teams are in that 8, 10, 11, 12 slot. So one or two of them may try to play the prices right, jump up and get one of those early first-round picks so they can get the quarterback of their choice. Lee, um, I know you've got plenty to get to on the uh, website. By the way, we had a nice little visit. Uh, we all kind of jumped into the YouTube chat yesterday after uh, we were finished. But uh, what's coming up on the uh, site this weekend? Uh, well, everything I, I wrote everything about uh, what's going on with the NFL uh, on my website, leehacksawhamilton.com. I, I did a big package on March Madness, the NCAA tournament. We had the first series of upsets last night, and trust me, there will be more shockers today and, and through the weekend. And obviously, a, a deep dive on the Otani crisis, because that story just seems to keep changing almost hour by hour. And uh, wrote a little bit about the, the tragic passing of Chris Simon uh, and the suicide and his fighting necessary in the NHL. So it's all on my website. If you check my website every morning, just subscribe to it. It's free. Uh, you'll get a lot of sports updates. And, of course, the podcast is rocking and rolling, and that's up on my YouTube channel all the time, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton Sports. So a lot of topics on the table, never a dull moment, awful lot of things to, to cover. That's why you're doing what you're doing, and I'm doing what I'm doing here. Hacksaw, thanks as always, buddy. Enjoy the madness this weekend, and have a great one. We'll talk to you next week. Have a great sports weekend. Thanks, Andrew. All right, great stuff with Hacksaw, as always. Uh, okay, uh, Marble's coming up in uh, just a few minutes, but uh, we'll do a little last call. If you were just jumping in uh, late or at a different point in the show, now is your chance, exclamation mark. Marbles, we will get to it in just a minute, but uh, just before we sort of finish up and get to the fun part of the program, let's uh, quickly hear from Scott Arneal. Um, he uh, spoke after practice just in the last half hour or so. Mike McIntyre there asking about Nikolai Ehlers missing the skate and uh, what exactly they were working on today. Obviously, the first question would be Nikolai was the only one that didn't skate, but I'm just curious about what... what yeah, just, is... just a maintenance day. Um, he had some things that are lingering too, so uh, busy schedule, three and four. You know, he's not a guy that 
really needs to work on his skating, so it's just more about making sure he's fresh for tomorrow. It's a nice, a little bit of a, I guess you could say, longer chat before you guys started the, the special teams part of it. Obviously, it was a big storyline last night, but really, you know, it has been a, a strength, especially in the second half of the season for the team. Just curious what kinds of things that you guys wanted to clean up. Yeah, those things happen. I mean, it, I, I don't like it. I don't like, I mean, I'll take a lot of the blame for the PK, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you get situations where, you know, those type of bounces happened on us last night, and we just tried to reset, talked about it. Um, just resetting in some of the, our principles that we talked about from the start of the year, uh, things we want to be good at um, each and every, no matter what power play we see, uh, we, that we want to do each and every uh, time out there. So um, just reset it. Hopefully we need to be better tomorrow uh, against the Islanders. All right. Uh, one more from the coach. And by the way, shout out to Mitch Clinton doing uh, some good work in the scrum there with Arnie. Um, here's Arnie on tomorrow's opponent, the New York Islanders. Don't forget the puck drops at noon, Winnipeg time. Yeah, I mean, they're a big team. They're a heavy team. Um, they don't give you a lot of space to work. Uh, they, they'll, they'll be a lot like Jersey last night where they clogged up the middle of the ice. So we're going to have to be disciplined and, uh, you know, make sure we work to get pucks down in low. But like you said, uh, they're in a big race. They're a hungry dog. we got to make sure that, uh, you know, that we play our game and we do what we need to do. And hopefully we can force them into mistakes by pushing so hard that they, you know, they're trying to win games that they maybe do some things that they don't normally do and we can capitalize on that. All right, there's a coach, uh, acting head coach uh, for Rick Bonus, um, and uh, it has been confirmed Bones will not be meeting the team this weekend. He will rejoin the club when they are back after the quick back-to-back in uh, Long Island and in D.C. on Sunday. Uh, one more clip. We talked about the power clip, a, a PK being an issue last night. They worked on it today. Mason Appleton spoke after practice and uh, just, just discussed what the uh, special teams unit, PK in particular, were working on. You know, normally when we work on special teams, it's it's power play, and then you know that's kind of the emphasis. But today was the opposite. The emphasis was on the kill. Um, you know, we changed or we cleaned up a couple of things that we feel are gonna tend to help us sort some stuff out and be able to to jump on them a little quicker. Uh, but you know, you look back at those goals, uh, it was almost like, dang, like how did that happen? Like how did that fall? Uh, you know, we didn't get seamed, and then they scored a backdoor tap in for an empty net. It was, you know, a tipper screen in front, or you know, some fluke, or and then the Hughes one, you know, block a shot, he gets the rebound. The other Hughes one, they have a flash screen. LB doesn't see it; it goes through his five hole. And then uh, Timo Meyer shoots it from the sauces it from the half wall on the blue line, and they get that tip in front. So that one was just like really. Um, but you know what happens? Obviously, we got to be a lot better on the kill. You can't give up three in a game and expect to win the game. So uh, that's unacceptable, but, you know, we, we cleaned some stuff up today, and I think we'll feel a lot better going into tomorrow with it. All right, there's Mason Appleton, big part of the PK, and uh, he certainly ran through the goals of what went wrong yesterday, Reem. Yeah, and I think Brandon said the same thing. Like, it wasn't like these these uh, power play goals were, as Appleton said, getting seamed, or, uh, you know, just saucing it over to Jack Hughes for a one-timer from the Ovechkin spot. Uh he went through all, all of them, and the, yeah, the first one was like a bounce. It went to Hughes off a rebound, and uh, the second one was was the or the third one was the screen one, and I think uh, and who was it? He sure beat his man to the front off a long shot from Timo Meyer. So they knew they went they broke down all the goals. And Mitch mentioned since January one, the Jets were. Well, they were eleventh in penalty kill percentage, but after last night's performance since January one, they moved down to 18th since January 1. So it's funny how you have one bad game, yeah. um, it can just sewer, you, know, you can go a top 10 team to a bottom third team in penalty kill. Well, you know what? One argument would be said if, uh, if you're going to have uh, you know a few go in, have them in one game, move on, be better, and uh, <laughs> clean it up for the Islanders tomorrow uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, shout out to Granny Bomber fan who mentioned some great news from Manitoba Curling. Colton and uh, Katrina Lott from Winnipeg Beach, uh, big winners of the Canadian Mixed. Um, that is great news. They have been ta- a top pairing uh, for a long time. And uh, obviously Colton now a big part of one of the top teams on the men's circuit as well, curling with Maddie Dunstone representing Manitoba. Speaking of curling, and uh, Remo, if you want to wrap up uh, marbles and get that ready, I will move over to the... Uh, Cool bet lines. And just before we get to the pucks, 
Rachel Holman, speaking of curling, is on an absolute heater right now. The class of the world's 11 and 0. Looking to get to 12 and 0 against the Team Korea tonight. And uh, the Koreans have been great as well. 9 and 2 so far. Great matchup. That, I believe, starts at 5 o'clock our time. I'm going to sprinkle on Canada minus 1.5 at minus 123. Holman has just been that good. Uh, the uh, Just to win the straight-up money line odds, Canada minus 200, Korea plus 150. Tonight in the NHL, four games. Hurricanes at Caps, the uh, Canes minus 182 favorites, Capitals plus 153. Dallas is home to the Penguins, Dallas minus 197 money line favorites, the Penguins plus 165. Avalanche, a monster, minus 379 favorite against the Blue Jackets. Blue Jackets, 3-1 to one on the money line. And uh, I will point you at the puck line. The Avs have been crushing puck lines lately. Plus 118 for the Avs to win by three. If you want to be a little more conservative, I think I'm going to throw this out for the uh, play of the day over on the Cool Bet socials. Minus 1.5 at minus 152 for the Avalanche. And then uh, pick them between the Kraken and Coyotes. If you head over to the exclusives, the Lock Shop Partner Parlay is back tonight. We had two out of three last night and just didn't get the puck line for the uh, Carolina because they only won in uh, overtime. But we're back at it with the puck line on the Avs tonight at minus one and a half and taking Dallas and Carolina to both win in regulation. That gave us a nice boost up to plus 525. And the fellas in the chat were at it. Nasty Chat Parlay, McKinnon to score, Dylan Gunther over two and a half shots on goal and a Clayton Keller point. That one is in at plus 450. Jump on that and check out the exclusives as well, particularly if you're getting into March Madness. Tons of great options for March Madness exclusives. And don't forget, every round, if you're playing a cool bet, you'll be able to pick one March Madness game and get a 20% multiplier on your win. I won my first rounder and then yesterday, Collapse by Nevada cost me. So I'm one on one on those. We'll hopefully get a winner tomorrow as we get into round number two. Of course, if you haven't played a cool bet before, use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks on your first deposit. And join myself and Dustin Nielsen before Winnipeg Sports Talk Monday to Friday at noon in the lock shop over at the Edmonton Sports Talk channel. All right, Remo. Let's uh, let's get ready for some marbles. Tristan Rivers music, the best. Appreciate him and all of his work. And a shout out to Sam Crow. Thanks for the super chat, Sam Crow. Great show as always. Enjoy the weekend. Go Jets, go. Appreciate you, Sam Crow. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we uh, are set to go. And while <laughs> while Reem puts the uh, gets us to, together and gets ready to set up, I will give a shout out to Amanda, who was the winner on March first. She's still on a high from the Marble Race win. As I just sent you a picture, Reem, last night, as disappointed as the as the game was last night, um, 
moved on afterwards and fired up a replay of her marble race win for uh, some interested people that wanted to know more about it. So uh, people still talking about that big win. And uh, let's see. Let's see who today's winner is. I'm in again, by the way. I'm going to be inconsistently. I'm getting into the mix on our weekly bet with my pals, Sean and Ross. Good luck to you all. Uh, Remo, what are we looking today? How many marbles and where are we at? Okay, 252 marbles. Let me just do it. I did see someone in chat mention they had to leave the pool in Vegas to uh, enter the marble race. I forget who. Shout out. That's the commitment we need here on WST. Yeah, we're, we're here for, you know, it's nice when people listen to the show, but sometimes we get pictures from people listening, exotic locations, but way. I also enjoy when people make sure they get in the marble race, whether they're on their honeymoon or wherever they may, there may be. So let me get this going here. Right on, right on. Uh, Eric's in there stunting about victories. Lots of people loving the uh, the Michael McDonald version of uh, the Tristan Rivers music. That's a favorite. Uh, that that definitely uh, that definitely is. Um, I see lots of love for Amanda and her big win in uh, in chat. Believe me, she's still on top of the world from it. That was the uh, said. Hey, you don't know how often it comes around again. We got two hundred and fifty plus every week for uh, for this thing. So. You gotta appreciate the victories. Who will be the victor today? We will find out in a minute. Of course, the winner will receive a uh, WST hoodie. And shout out to our friends at Shipham and Associates who uh, helped us out with the hoodies. Saw Shippy last night as well after the game. So uh, great to see the fells. Fun choose Thursday night, with the exception of the result of the game. But we move on tomorrow. Islanders noon. But right now. It's time to get into a marble race on WST. Uh, all right, Remo, where are we at today? Another new, uh, another new um, uh, track. Yeah, it looks went like. through. I, yeah, went through a bunch. This one is called "Deathly Hilarious Parody." Ooh, interesting. Is the name of the race. We have two hundred fifty-two marbles in there. All right, and I, I'm in, right? You are in as Hustler in all caps. Okay, good. There's all caps Kyle, all caps Huss. That's, uh, I figured. I, I had a good performance when I went in all caps. I'm going to keep it that way, I think. Well, did you hear about all caps Kyle? He's He had to change He changed his name as a joke and won't let him change it back to all caps Kyle for like 12 days. So he's been in chat <laughs> as like Dave's heavy eyes. I think that's a Dave Manuk from Illegal Curve <laughs> reference. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll know if it's Dave Dave's heavy eyes. That's all caps, Kyle. All right. Great week. Should be an awesome weekend with the back-to-back -back games. Uh, we appreciate everyone jumping on and hanging out with us, all the guests. But let's have some fun. It's Friday afternoon. You know what that means. Remus, drop the marbles. Let's do it one more time on a Friday on Winnipeg Sports Talk. EK Posty with a nice start. Paul Carr. What's up, Paul? Three power, Mike Cochran. Ooh, everyone's stopping right now. This is going to be... Uh... I'm trying to figure out why. What's going on here? Oh, now they're into the funnel. Here we go. Are this Is this a funnel? Uh, I think it's like a rotating disc, and they're going to uh, go... Ah, okay, I see. So now the next group has come through. Good start. Very important on this one. Scott Westman. What's up, Scott? What a great chance to hang with Scott at the uh, whiskey event we do with Canadian Club over at the uh, Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame. Oh, Gregory Liverpool's making a move. What up, GFL? Gilbert Marion, Ken B. Jamie Stevenson, the dreams in the mix. What is up? <laughs> I love I love when just friends of mine now are finding the marble race and making a point to pop in on YouTube, even if they're normal, normally podcast listeners. All right, we're seeing some interesting stops in this where everyone just sort of bucks, buckles up and then uh, we let everyone out at the same time. Where are we at now? We've got Ken B on the left. Looks like Ken is in the mix. D Sizzle 73 also looking pretty good. Yeah, Ken B and D Sizzle at the front. Scott Westman. James Stevenson. What? Jamie, if Jamie won, that would drive the other guys crazy. Oh, it looks like my buddy Tyson Ducharme just got thrown over the top rope. It was a bit Rest of a jump there. Brody, 
Uh, we're losing a few. Running man, bye-bye, former Victor. But we got Ken, Jamie, son of Dork, also in. And a few other... Uh, Whoa, this is hard to keep whoa, track whoa, whoa. of all these right sorry, now. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I got distracted there. Wesley yeah. Mitchnuck, James Stevenson. All right, we've got another stop. It's almost like an IndyCar race where, uh, you know, or a NASCAR race where they flag it. Yellow flag. And then we go back to green. Well, this is, I'll tell you what, this looks like it's going to be an incredibly close race. That's for sure. Oh, Todd for Tanny over the top rope. Sorry about that, Todd. Yin Vivian, sorry, Yin, did not go your way today. Uh, Kent Rolmer, Turd Ferguson, Leslie Mitchnuck, all in the mix. Whoa, here we go. Spinning around. Golfer Ken taking the other side. We'll see if that might be an advantage as we get through. Everyone's back together. It's a pretty long race, actually. Farmer Brain in first. Turd just got dropped. Oh, Jamie Stevenson dropped out. Here we go. Farmer Brain. Ken B. Looks like Farmer Brain has the... Oh, this is a moving one, too. Farmer Brain got in, though. That is our winner. Farmer Brain. Definite first-time winner, I believe. Farmer Brain, congratulations. Send us an email, winnipegsportstalk at gmail.com. Let us know what size you are for the hoodie, and uh, we'll hit you up next week, and you can pop by and pick it up at some point that works for you. Top 10 today. Farmer Brain, Ken B., Scott Westman, John Paul's in fourth. See ya later is five. <laughs> Wayne, Wayne Bretzky, great name, number six. D Sizzle 73 at seven. The GFL himself, caller number one, Gregory Liverpool, number eight. Stoop 223, ninth. And uh, Stem Innist, number 10. All right, we're going to have to see. Uh, Everyone, oh, there's Amanda popping out at the end. Farmer Brain, 190. Let's run down the list. I'm going to see where I finished up. Everybody else, I see Paul Carr. Winnipeg, Gabriel Vivaldi. Got a chance to meet WGV after one of the games recently. Ooh, Ross with a big, big performance today. 16th. That will win the head-to-head -head with the three of us. Let's see where uh, I ended up. And Shorn, oh, there's the Gitch. He's a well, 33rd, not too bad. Dallas Pauls. Hey, Dallas, saw him at the game last week. Ryan Kibbins, Bozeman, 47th. Looks like I'm going to be on the wrong end of this one today. Both of the guys already in. Spency, 5 Sensi. Shout out to the Lock Shoppers jumping in over from the EST channel for the Marvel Race today. Here's Cowboy. And uh, 81st. Oh, and Amanda technically did not even finish. He got bit by the fire right before he could have gotten uh, into it. Um, that being said, lots of uh, lots of eliminations. But I have a feeling I will be in these eliminations. Thomas Millich. Yeah, I threw in Thomas Millich, uh, A.K. Gasama got in there. Steve AK. Cooley, Steve Coolius got in too. Nicely done. Hugh Wachenko, what's up, Hugh? Greg Hasbeek, Leanne. These are all the everyone that got thrown over the top rope. And there's Hustler. Not a great performance at all. Um, so, yeah, we'll just go through everyone else that uh, did not make it through to the end. Congratulations to anyone that did finish the race. This was a pretty tough one today. Uh, but, yeah, overall, it's, uh, you know, we move on from yesterday, Remus. We get the vibes back up with the marble race and move on to uh, Long Island and D.C., before what's going to be an awesome week with the team back here, Edmonton, Vegas, and Ottawa, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Uh, I am, uh, listen, I'm not in a hurry to finish the weekend, but I am looking forward to next week. Should be a real good one for us here on WST. Yeah, uh, you know, big homestand, divisional games. Thursday has biggest bar night of the year, so not exactly Thursday. Yeah, I it's forgot not that Good Friday was coming up next week. Yeah, it's not a Friday game, or uh, but we've seen you know it's basically Friday with the, on the long weekend. So we've seen some big crowds on Friday nights that sold out the other week. So I imagine against Vegas, who I don't know if they're the Jets' biggest rival, but they're in the. I think they're are they the most hated team here, Vegas? Them I or think Minnesota? it's Minnesota. I think it's Minnesota, but Vegas would be right up there. 
So See I- everyone on Madden Chat. Awesome Friday show, guys. Have a great Jets Fueled weekend. Go, Jets, go. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Tyson, I'm last. First over the top rope. Uh, everyone else having a fun. Um, great to see everyone yucking it up in chat. Good times. <laughs> it's your boy, Bruce. Shout out to Matinee Games and Weekend Day Drinking. Um, yeah, good, good time to maybe get together for brunch with some friends. Mm-hmm. Fire up some uh, good food in the afternoon and uh, watch the hockey game. Get into some March Madness. Watch the final of the Valspar which we will look at um, should be uh, should be a heck of a lot of fun. Um, all right, that's going to do it for us today, gang. we got to get the pot up. Have a great Friday night, a great weekend. We will see you Monday, 1 p.m., four-day week, but a huge four-day week on WST with Edmonton and Vegas coming in on Tuesday and Thursday. We will see you then. Thanks again to all the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. And uh, it's time to go. Crack a generic in 1919. The weekend is on. See you Monday. Oh, my God. Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.